We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H., this is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And yes, got lots of questions. We've got a bit of a backlog, so we'll, we'll try and make it through. It's not going to happen. <laughs> I know. I did uh, meet a listener this week. Oh, ah, nice. Yes, uh, Nathan ah. came from, I guess he's from out of, he came in town for work, let me know he was here, and uh, we met for a, a couple of beers. Cool, cool. Which he purchased for me. <laughs> it was very nice of him. And I, I looked at my watch. I, I told him I didn't, I didn't have a lot of time because mm -hmm. it's in the middle of the week and I got kids and all sorts of stuff. And uh, I looked at my, my watch and I looked at the time and I was like, oh, I got plenty of time. I looked at it like two minutes later. It felt like I was like, oh, <laughs> crap. <Nope. laughs> I just got up and ran out of there. I'm like, I gotta go. I gotta go. <laughs> so thank you, Nathan, for uh, the, the drinks and the conversation. I brought my uh, Oppo PM 2s. Oh, okay. With me, yep. I'm gonna plug him into his phone and take a quick gander. I have not. I mean, I have not really taken a close look at those headphones. I've had them for years. Yeah. But they were starting to look a little rough. Oh, <laughs> you know, okay. The, you know the the pads and the top of the the yep. band there where your head touches. So I wonder what these look like. Yeah, really those are holding up pretty well. Those like are the PM threes that you're wearing week. on the podcast. Yeah, the PM threes. So, anyways, uh, that was fun. I also finished uh, The Punisher last night. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is pretty good. Uh, I didn't think it was as good as uh, Daredevil Season 3, but it was pretty good. I, I enjoyed it. it. I liked it better than I liked Season 1. Okay. I, so, I liked Season 1 quite a lot on The Punisher. So. Uh, I thought it was okay. There was a, lot, there was a big lull in the middle of, <laughs> oh, I can't. I got beat up real bad. This time he gets beat up real bad, and he's like uh, Keanu Reeves and John Wick. Oh, okay. He just keeps Man. going. <laughs> You're like, like you know, remember three episodes ago when your hand was broken? Yep. Doesn't you, It's not broken anymore, I guess. It's been like <laughs> a day. <laughs> so I'm wearing a bulletproof suit, but getting run over by a car still doesn't hurt. Nope. John Wick good. John Wick 2. John Wick 3, where he learns to fly, I guess. It is a good title for John Wick 3, or subtitle. Parabellum. That's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's thank our listeners of the week. Become a listener of the week. I have to do support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to www. Oh, do I do the other stuff? We didn't no. say how to get in touch with us. I guess we normally well, do, do that anything. first. I was already dead. This is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask us by email us question at avrant.com. Yes. Go to www.avrant.com. Uh, you can leave a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. You can reach out to us directly, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Mm -hmm. Though, question at avrant. Question at avrant.com. That's the one to remember. That's our email. That's where to send your questions. His That's question right. at avrant.com. Thank right. you. All right, our listeners of the week. We've got uh, Robert and Nathan. I believe this is the same Nathan that okay. I had a beer with. So <laughs> thank you, Nathan, again, for our listener of the week. Uh, he They went to www.avrent.com, clicked on the Pi Us, buy us, I always say Pi Us, mm. but buy us a, co a cup of coffee link and went to a PayPal donation site where you can go through uh, your credit card or you can use your PayPal account. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, thank you gentlemen for that. Yeah, Robert, Nathan, thank you for those donations. I like pie, so pieing us would be just fine by me. Yeah. Uh, Nathan had some interesting suggestions. Remind me to talk about those. Okay. Because uh, we were talking about the podcast and stuff. I see. Uh, we also want to th thank our 82, broke the 80 mm -hmm. mark, 82 mm -hmm. patrons over at patreon.com. It's a service where you can sign up to support your content creators monthly. So they take a monthly draw and they split it up as you determine so it's a minimum of a dollar a month per content content creator and we have 82 people over at patreon now so we would thank uh, brian and steve who let us know that they were one of our patrons so that's right patrons. yeah thank you so much over there at uh, patreon.com slash av rant podcast if you'd like to sign up for an automatic monthly donation and brian and steve thank you for being two of our 82 patrons so if you can't support us financially, if you find some other way to support us, just let us know what it is. We want to thank Jay, who shared on Facebook that the last time he listened to AV Rant was back in 20, 
2008 when he was selling Panasonic plasmas. He sort of got out of the home theater loop for many years and felt he'd fallen way behind on all the latest tech. But now that he's got a new job with a long commute, he's found his way back to us. Long commutes, we are yep. your, we're, we're your jam, that baby. Is a, that is a common <laughs> thing people, people mention. I work out for two hours a week total and <laughs> av rant fits right in there uh but he's got a new job okay he's from, uh he decided to listen in chronological order so he's way back at episode 432 we're in like the 600s now aren't we? yeah 628 we're up to now yeah he's got uh when he wrote this, episodes so when he wrote this this week so you're you're still behind on the tech thing <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> You're going to see the progression, though. If I had the time, it'd be interesting to go back and come all the way back up through. So he says he has no idea how long it's going to take him to catch up. It's going to take you, if you have a two-hour commute, it's going to take you about 200, 200 days. 200 days, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see you next year. Uh, but the, the, here's a listener of the week surprise for you. So, Jay, let us know when you're caught up. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, we'll see you in a year. <laughs> Brian, it was a fellow who needed to move his projector a uh, half inch to an inch farther away from his screen in order to completely fill the frame with the projected image. We recommended the chief spider mount and possibly the lateral shift bracket if necessary. He just got the mount and it works, so he sent chief an email letting them know it was our recommendation. There so you go. Thank you. I'm very Brian. pleased that that worked out. That's uh, that's good news. So I I told you guys I bought the, the RBHP. S whatever the E P S B E P S B S yes yeah Bluetooth the headphones. Uh, earphones yeah. one of them's not working anymore so oh I e- I emailed uh, R B H mm-hmm. and if uh, you see my eyes glance down into the side I am looking <laughs> for the email I gotcha. emailed them at the warranty thing last night to see if they would do anything about it but I'm sure I mean, they will everything's supposed to be like a like a year yeah warranty, at least so yeah we should be fine there. Uh, in the news, Philip in Europe, which is a completely different company other than Philips in North America, or Philips. Oh, I thought this Philip was the guy who told us about no, this. No, 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 it's, it's Philips, the company Philips. But uh, yeah, in Europe, they're a different company than Philips in North America. So Philips Not... in North America, they still, I guess they still do make TVs occasionally, They right? do, but they're made yeah. by different corporations. Yeah. They announced their 2019 TV lineup. With the big news uh, there is that, much like Panasonic, they're now supporting both HDR10 Plus and Dolby Vision. Yeah, so oh, the only ones we've heard of have been in Europe because Panasonic does not sell in North America anymore. Uh, so yeah, Panasonic and Philips in Europe uh, supporting both of the dynamic metadata Wasn't HDR Panasonic formats. one of the very first plasmas that came out? I don't know. I feel like that's true. I thought it was Pioneer. DTSX for games is coming to windows and xbox one oh god help us <laughs> <laughs> dtsx in uh, games i mean of course you can already play it off of physical discs off of movie discs it already works but uh yeah. oh they're gonna games. screw it up and since we are always complain about the way xbox one handles the audio joel and suggests we write to steve wills Yep. Is that how you say that? Wilson's? Wilson's. Wilson's. Wilson's? Just That's not how you spell odd. Wilson's. That is how he spells his version well, of Well, he Wilson's. spells it wrong. Yeah. There's like three <laughs> S's in that S's, name. Yeah. <laughs> He's Microsoft's audio lead who made the announcement about the DTSX support on Twitter. Dude, we got to at that dude. <laughs> yep. Surrounds are surrounds, not surround backs. This, this has been dude, going on get it right. for a little too long now. Yes. <laughs> we need like a hashtag. <laughs> surrounds are on sides hashtag get it right uh when nvidia g link and amd's free sync g sync what did i say d link d link whatever g sync and amd's free sync uh variable refresh rate systems launched in 2013 they were incompatible if mm. you bought an nvidia g sync graphics card you needed a g sync monitor and that and an amd graphics card needed a free sync monitor and has remained that way until now but there are more FreeSync monitors available, and any current TVs that support variable refresh rate use FreeSync. Mm-hmm. So magically, although nothing more than the firmware uh, through nothing more than the firmware update now, Nvidia's 10 and 20 series G-Sync graphics cards are able to work with FreeSync monitors. So yay! Maybe they weren't that incompatible after all. It turns oh, out very similar ideas. Although uh, it is mentioned that presently it only works using the DisplayPort connection, so it still won't work for televisions that only have HDMI inputs sure. and not DisplayPort ports. But uh, I'll bet they get that working at some point because yeah. it seems as though FreeSync has kind of won the battle. 
So Carl, Carl Herler mentioned of Canopy.com, the free streaming service that works with your library card. He's a fan and says that they offer quite a lot of content that isn't available anywhere else, let alone for free. And since Tom mentioned that he wasn't able to easily sign up since he only found a college library close to him to work at, that is working with Canopy, Carl's just looking into whether your state offers a library share program. He's in Texas and they offer the text share card that you get from your local library, which then gives you access to over 500 libraries across the state without needing an individual card for each one. Uh, I actually talked to my friend who works at that college. Okay. And she is under the impression that, that there's not much content on there and none of it's any good. So I said that that didn't seem... I'm like, I don't know where she got that idea. So uh, the movies that I saw on there, you know, just from scrolling, it looked like there were some things on there that I want to see. Sure. So I'm, you know, I mentioned it to her in front of her husband. Her husband perked up and said what we can stream stuff for free now? like <laughs> some stuff i mean whatever they have on canopy but it's free so why not at least have a look right so uh, i'm gonna get that set up at their house and then maybe uh, get, get her to set it up at my house too uh so the couple of things that nathan and i talked about during the 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 drink beer thing mm -hmm. was two things He's, he said i wonder if there's some way we can get some sort of fun some sort of you know fundraiser for you guys to you know save up money to get plane tickets to go see so, so like, one of you can go see the other one so you can actually do a podcast <laughs> live in person i'm like seems over the top but uh. i mean i'm like i've never met him and one thing about nathan that was nice is that he wasn't overly tall like you know austin <laughs> towers above everybody yep. on the way up there so uh he was a normal height it was very nice uh but the other suggestion he had which i thought was actually pretty good uh was that we and I just forgot it. What was it? I don't uh, know. I wasn't there. I know. <laughs> Sorry. That we talked to Dave Fabricant or maybe right. somebody like that and see if they are interested in having an on location podcast, you know, where we do like a, you know, a show where basically uh, record everything and do interviews with them and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> anyway, so that's that. It's out there in the ether. There you go. If anybody knows Dave Fabricant, ask him if he wants to spend money on two plane tickets so oh, we geez. can talk to him in person. Because <laughs> we're not going to, we can't pay for it. It's all the way in California, so that's travel for, for everyone. Well, I know, but it's closer for you than this for me. It is. Nathan. But then again, you have to go through customs and ICE. The ICE agents will probably take you into quarantine or whatever. I don't know if this is the same Nathan or not. Could be. Could be. So when the very first 4K resolution TV came out on the market, uh, we didn't have HDMI 2.0 yet, but HDMI 1.4 was still technically capable of carrying 4K resolution signals. The bigger hurdle ended up being HDCP 2.2 copy protection. So some early adopters wound up with 4K resolution displays that had enough bandwidth to accept a 4K signal, but any 4K sources would refuse to send anything higher than 1080p because of 10, uh, HDCP. Mm -hmm. Now, to go along with 8K, there's HDCP 2.3. <gasps> Yeah. There was talk about <laughs> HDMI 2.1 at CES. LG even confirmed that all of their high-end 4K and 8K TVs would have full 48 gigabits per second bandwidth HDMI 2.1 ports. But what about the HDCP <laughs> side of things? Will history repeat itself with early adopters once again having nece the necessary display resolution and HDMI bandwidth, but they end up being foiled by HDCP 2.3? All right, so let's, like, th there's so many acronyms in this. Let's just yes, break this down. Okay, so basically... And the, the answer to the question is yes. <laughs> Early adopters always get screwed. That's the answer <laughs> to the question. But the, the what happened was we got 4K displays that could put a 4K image up. And I mean, what's uh, which is Infinite Gary has uh, his run code was like that, right? It could or you could do an expanded mm. color. Oh palette, yeah, well it could do yeah right? wider color. I mean, I wider I actually color. have a great example which was uh, Sony's X900A. Uh, right. TV, which had 4K resolution, but it did not have HDCP 2.2. So right. you can connect uh, an Ultra HD Blu-ray player to it, and the Ultra HD Blu-ray player will say, well, I don't care that you have you know, 4K pixel count. <laughs> you don't have the HDCP 2.2, so I'm only going to send you a 1080p resolution right. signal. Yeah. And the, the HECP is basically copy protection. That's, That's right. That's what the CP is. Right. It, it's it's a handshake issue, basically, which says, hey, are you a registered, licensed connection, device, source, or display? And if you don't have the copy protection handshake, then you get 
kicked down to the whatever handshake you do have. That's right. So HDMI 1.4, it was H, it was HTCP what 2.0 or something like that or one. I can't remember how the the numbers didn't always line up with each other. So, but yeah, whatever, it was like whatever that. the lower number was. Yeah. So now we're going to get 8K displays, mm-hmm. and they're going to come out with being able to put up an 8K uh, uh, picture, and if you can send it over a normal HDMI cable that is you know with a normal connection as that that is right now that we have right now or that is coming out very soon there's no guarantee that they're going to firmware update that bad boy to have the HTCP copy protection on it and in fact historically they have not so in the case of LG they actually put out a press release back in September of 2018 saying they had selected a particular chip manufacturer right uh, synopsis spelled oddly but anyway uh that's the that's the chip manufacturer and they were saying they have an hdmi 2.1 full 48 gigabits per second bandwidth solution that already includes hdcp 2.3 and they furthermore say that those chips are backwards compatible with hdcp 2.2 so if anything upstream of the television is still on hdcp 2.2 it's not as though that isn't going to work because it will only accept hdcp 2.3 or something like that so um so as far as lg goes i mean they already made that announcement so they they should be okay but Everybody else, I mean, the thing is, Samsung has basically said for their 8K displays, uh, what you would buy right this second with like their Q900R, it doesn't have HDMI 2.1 and therefore probably doesn't have HDCP 2.3 either. But all of their inputs go through their one connect box, which can be replaced Replaced. separate from the panel. And they've actually said, if you contact them once their HDMI 2.1 solution is available, they'll swap out your One Connect box for free. Yeah. So that's their way of tackling it. Uh, I don't know what Sony's going to do. I don't know what you know all the I'm others gonna are going to do. Dead honest with you, dude. I don't believe any of these people. <laughs> I don't. I, mean, waiting, I will believe it when I see it. Waiting because... an extra year on your 8K display, I would advise anyway. Because, yes. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. Yeah. I would. I. I I, I, I'm just now getting to the point where I'm recommending people buy 4K at all, much less sure, 8K. Yeah. So, I mean, think about like, just the, the, the OLEDs. We've had some issues with, you know, color and some banding or whatever that, mm-hmm. that thing is that you guys were complaining about. And, you know, LED backlit displays are finally getting to the point where we've got, we're getting, you know, lots of local do- uh, zones of mm-hmm. dimming. I just, I have such a hard time. And then... All it takes is for one manufacturer to say, ah, it's not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I know we said we were going to do it, but it's not technologically feasible, which is code for, yeah, we could totally do it if we want to, but we don't want it to. D- it and depends on what chip supplier they select and, and yeah. what they provide. Yeah. He also asked, what about AV receivers? Again, uh, there were early AV receivers that claimed to be able to pass through 4K resolution. They didn't claim. They could. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, But then the early adopters had to contend with the full 18 gigabits per second HDMI 2.0 and HDCP 2.0. Two and the whole Dolby Vision pass through debacle. Mm-hmm. Do we predict similar troubles from the first wave of HDMI 2.1 AV receivers? Yep, I do. I do yeah. predict that it's going to happen. I mean, it won't be every model, right? It won't be every one. It won't be every manufacturer. And within a manufacturer, it you know some will be better than others, or some will have the yeah. Some will some come won't. out a bit sooner, but yeah. maybe because they came out sooner, there's going to be a feature that they don't include that someone who right. waited a little while did. It's not always that way, though. Sometimes the first to market is the one that has everything. But yeah, I mean, for yeah, example, used like Yankee used to do that all the time. Yeah, like uh, Denon, uh, their X8500H, which presently, if you buy it right now, is HDMI 2.0 and mm-hmm. HDCP 2.2. But they've said they designed it so that the H HDMI board inside could be replaced so that when HDMI 2.1 and HDCP 2.3 are ready to go, they'll be able to replace that board and you won't have to buy an entirely new flagship receiver. Uh, So that's great. Now, will they wait long enough, you know, so that the board that they replace it with, or maybe there'll be two board replacements if something goes, you know, similar over, um, you know, what Monoprice announced for their HTP1 processor. They're like, yeah, right now it's designed with HDMI 2.0, but they've got an upgrade path. They've designed that in so that they'll be able to swap out the HDMI boards. Um, And of course- This whole, we designed it so that we could switch out the boards. I don't believe mm -hmm. that either. (laughs) 
Well, I believe I mean, that they, they any did receiver, if you try hard enough, Dennett you did, can replace the HMI board. Denon did it's it last like, time with the X7200W. That, that yeah, worked. They did. Yeah, did. So. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying that it doesn't. That it's not possible. What I'm saying is I don't think they necessarily designed it with this in mind. I think afterwards somebody said, oh, wait, what? And they went to some engineer. Okay. Can we switch out the HDMI board if we want to? Pretty like much all it amounts receiver? to is they made sure not to bury the HDMI board right. in a place that's totally inaccessible. That's really what it amounts to. Yeah. So on a different talk topic, Nathan is trying to help a friend through the best way to set up some... Oh, this is the same Nathan. Hmm. So the best way to set up uh, some whole house audio. I talked to him about this one. We okay. Were, yeah. And he'd like to use Amazon's voice con assistant to control what music plays uh, where. His friend uses a Marantz SR6010 receiver, uh, but that model does not have Heos built in. Mm -hmm. He's got four other pairs of in-ceiling and on-wall speakers in various rooms and outside. So he has four additional zones. He wants DI DIY whole house audio solution that can be controlled by voice. They've looked at the Heos drive, but it's quite expensive. Any suggestions? So my suggestion to him was to look at the one of those uh, whole house audio... not. Um, the distribution amps from Monoprice right. that we've talked yes. about before, and yeah. then like get mo you know multiple you know fire sticks essentially or whatever it would take sure. in order to to stream different things to different rooms. Yeah, what Monoprice and Dayton basically have the exact same thing. Dayton's is the DAX sixty six, and Monoprice is their whole home audio matrix distribution amplifier. And what this allows you to do is plug in as many as six sources, which can then be routed to as many as six different stereo zones. Uh, right. The Mono Price one goes for six hundred dollars. The Dayton one goes for like six fifty or seven hundred. So very similar in prices. Um, now the question is, how would you control that all by voice? Because natively they don't. And in fact, if you want to control the Mono Price or the Dayton with an app on your phone or a tablet, you actually have to get a little bit of additional equipment for that. Um, the apps on either iOS or Android cost a little bit. They're like 6 or $7. That's not the thing. But you have to get this little iTac Flex device so that it can connect to your network uh, with an RS-232 cable. Uh, so it's oh, okay. it, that little thing. So that adds about an extra $120 uh, onto the total price. But that's still a lot cheaper than almost anyone else's whole house audio distribution setup. Now that just gets you the app, and the app still doesn't work with any of the voice assistants. So mm. maybe you, if all you want to do is control it with voice, maybe all you do is, is go the simplest route, which is you buy several dots, <laughs> and you assign each of them as the room, because all the Amazon uh, Echo devices can sort of like talk to each other, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And you can say, you know, play play this music out of this room. So you just assign a dot as, you know, whatever name of the room. Now, those are all uh, wherever this distribution amp is. And you basically have one dot for each room. Right. right? Which it's, is kind of what I was suggesting. Yeah, instead, right. of, instead of sharing a dot uh, and being... Because in order to share, say, one dot uh, amongst all the rooms, you'd have to use the app to tell right, it to right, say right, right, play right. this source out of whichever rooms but if you basically just have a dot for each room now just via voice you say play it out of that room and that dot now plays out of that room and if you want all of the rooms to play the same thing we just say well all the rooms play the same thing and all four or six of your dots will just play the same thing so i think that's right sort i of think it's an setup. amazon i think amazon just came up with a like a hub okay that you could use to that is designed, I think, to control multiple uh, devices within your house. We're trying so hard not to say the name. What a stupid I thing know. that we can't say the name because it'll set off people's devices. But you know who <laughs> we're talking about. She who shall not be. I know. That's so dumb. Uh, so I, basically, I mean, I, the only problem I see with this solution is if you are asking for Pandora to play you it's, it's sometimes i've never i've never tried to get it to play out of multiple devices the same mm -hmm. song out of multiple devices so it may be hard to do that whole distribution thing i it may require a little bit of verbal link you know, right uh, to get gymnastics. it all synchronized yeah yeah so you you might have there's going to be a bit of a learning curve on it but a yeah, little this bit is kind of this is kind of my but basically what dots are what 35 bucks or something like that something I mean, like that yeah yeah there i mean we're talking about for four zones we're talking about you know a little bit over 100 bucks 125 yeah, because all, all you need is their audio output to 
go into the audio input. I mean, on the back yeah. of the Monoprice or the Dayton, uh, they have so they have six different inputs which could be shared, but they also have individual inputs for each zone, and that's right. the way I'd suggest setting this up. And so, then you would ju basically you you name each one of your dots. That's right. So, so you're you really not it, using you know, living the, room, bedroom, whatever. Yeah. You know, it, it should you should you be able to make it a little bit more intuitive. But I think you might need like the hub in order to help control right. everything the way you want. Yeah. So it, it's going to be a little bit of you have to do a little bit of research but we've definitely pointed you on the right sure path. yeah the, the other one i wanted to suggest which would cost more money for sure mm -hmm. uh but it's something you might consider would be to sort of uh just delve yourself into yamaha's music cast system because mm -hmm. music cast already works with alexa that's that's already <laughs> done so you could go that way as well uh again they have like pre-amplifier units uh, which you could have one or more of those plugged into a distribution amplifier. That's that's still another way. Or they just have music cast separate little wireless amplifiers that could power the speakers on their own. Right. So you could have you know four of those. Now it's all in the music cast system. You can now use the music cast app, which is great. Uh, and it, it'll be controlled by the voice assistant by Amazon's voice assistant. It's that's already built in. It's just it would cost more money than uh, the multiple echoes and mono price combo. Carl. Carl says there are quite a few movies where the only physical disc release is a regular 1080p Blu-ray, but the same movie is available in 4K HDR with Atmos audio on iTunes. But of course, iTunes version is more heavily compressed and it's being streamed. So which version will actually deliver the best picture and sound quality? Well, okay. Let's pretend that you have like a T1 connection. So bit rate is not an issue. Um, <laughs> Because that's you don't you, know, need, you don't need that much. I know 20, twenty five I mean, megabits per second. That's what you need. So let's just pretend that bit. You know, you're not you know dropping sure. any. Your bits internet or connection like that. is not the choke. I you know, I don't know that they remaster these things for iTunes. They may be coming to you in this uh, higher resolution, but I don't necessarily know that they do anything other than just scale it. Well, the HDR so, though. The HDR. Yeah. I mean, really, that to me that answers it. Is this a movie where you think it'd be worthwhile seeing it in HDR? Because, like, honestly, in in pure picture quality in terms of sharpness and the colors being right and not having any banding and not having any artifacts, the 1080p Blu-ray actually wins, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that is I just because you know it's uh, the the iTunes version is more heavily compressed. You might see some compression artifacts here or there. You might see some color banding here or there because of the data compression. But obviously, on the 1080p Blu-ray, you're not getting HDR. So that more or less answers it for me. Uh, and I mean, the other one is if the iTunes version has Atmos audio and the Blu-ray doesn't, which there's no reason the Blu-ray couldn't contain it on a technical level but sometimes they just choose not to put the atmos audio on there now the itunes version is dolby digital plus atmos so it is data compressed it is lossy but if the 1080p blu-ray doesn't have atmos then it doesn't have atmos right so right. It, it's kind of like do you want to see it in hdr do you want to hear it in atmos uh if atmos isn't available on the 1080p blu-ray then that answers that if and obviously hdr isn't so that kind of answers that but now all else, I'd go for you know, I don't have 4K or HDR, so right. I'm, I am probably coming from a place of bias in that right. I don't have it. But my default is I'll prefer the disc over streaming every time. Okay. Yeah. I, I wouldn't I hear what you're saying. every time, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, if, if I've actually started, like, a movie on, you know, streaming because I was like, oh, I haven't seen this movie in a while. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I started it on Netflix and went, I've, oh, I own this movie. Stop the movie. Go get the disc. Plug right. the disc. You know, I mean, some movies it doesn't really matter that much, but most of them I would prefer to watch the disc. Yeah. I hear what you're saying, and you're mm -hmm. right. There's, you know, the HDR and the... First of all, I would never stream something just because it had Atmos. <laughs> really? Just, you just no. upmix up mix the 5.1 or the 7.1? The 5.1 or 7.1, yeah. I can, never, kind of, sure. I can kind of agree with that, too. The HDR is more compelling, yeah. but... Even then, I would rather have not HDR with no visual artifacts mm -hmm. than HDR with visual artifacts. But it's a personal preference thing. Yeah. Joseph, what is our opinion of the Ascend Acoustic Sierra Luna speakers? There's lots of talk and praise for the Sierra 2s, but hardly anything about the Lunas. If he's got a pair of subs, there's no need for the deeper bass extension offered by the Sierra 2s, correct? Uh, 
probably I, these are like the the bitty bookshelves right that have the raw ribbon and all that yeah i mean they they basically it was the idea was to take the sierra 2 and shrink it down so that it could be wall mountable that's right. more or less what the luna that was the idea behind the luna was to make a satellite speaker sized version of the sierra 2 now that necessitated using a smaller woofer than what the sierra right. 2 uses which means it doesn't play quite as low and it doesn't play quite as loud that is just a fact, and it's a smaller cabinet that is wall-mountable, and it's just shy of six inches deep from front to back, so it is definitely more easily mounted on right. a wall. Uh, so, uh, I mean, really, that's all it is, is that it, it can't play quite as loud. It isn't quite as efficient. It's like two decibels less efficient. So for right, you so know, it's 85, I think. I yeah, that's right. So it's like two decibels less efficient, and its maximum output is quieter. Uh, but that's really it. Right. That's it. So anechoically, it's it, it, it's negative three dB point is around sixty hertz. Yep. So you know, really, the, the the question here you ask yourself is, what is your use case scenario? Are you mm -hmm. in a big great room, uh, or are you in a small, or are you sitting very close to your yeah. speaker? If you're sitting very close to your speaker, these are uh, uh, yes, they are one hundred percent fine. Now, why are people talking about the big ones? Because when reviewers are asked what they want mm. to review, they never say the small speaker. Yeah. They always say, "Give me the big ones." Yeah, because they want the big ones. They want to, you know, they want to get the. You know, that's what people are most interested in. But I would expect, you know, very similar performances out of both. Oh of yeah, these I mean the components are nearly identical, and actually, yeah. Dave Fabricant, who designed them, has said that the Sierra Luna is because the cabinet is even narrower because it's got a smaller woofer. Uh, right. That the dispersion is even better, you know, to the sides. Like it's even wider dispersion than the Sierra this 2 was, because there's there's less cabinet to deal with. This was something I was talking about with Nathan the other day because he's got tower speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's got the Sierra Tower, Sierra 2 Towers. And uh, he's like, my room's kind of small. And, you know, I, my idea is that someday I'll be in a bigger room. So I got these big speakers. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've heard smaller speakers and the, I, I hate to admit it, but they sound better. Mm -hmm. You know, he's heard the the smaller Sierra twos, the bookshelves, yep. and not the towers, and he thought they sounded better. And of course, it's a different room, and there's mm -hmm. a bunch of other mm -hmm. things that are going into that. But I have so gotten over this this notion that I that <laughs> bigger is better in in home theater. We have, you know, all everything about our society tells us that you know get the biggest best thing that you can possibly get, and in home theater. It really isn't true. You know? No, I mean, sometimes Having, the bigger one means you have to compromise the placement yes. because it, that's where it has to go because it's the only place it'll physically fit. I'm looking at these Lunas and I'm going, man, dude, if I was going to get rid of my speakers, these would be on my short list because I sit real close. Yeah. And I'm not worried. About, I, I'm, I'm sure I can hit reference volume, which I almost never do. Oh, yeah. I'm sure I can hit reference volume from where I'm sitting and they're cheaper and they're smaller and they'd be easy to place and then you know and 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 all these other things. I have it's it took me years to get past this, but it's the <laughs> same thing with subwoofers. We we've had this happen before. Oh I bought the you know the PB oh, the four thousands or ultra for whatever they are 16 called. ultras sure yeah and then you're like dude your room's 12 by 12 <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> you know yeah. placement options are very limited yeah, yeah no so. so opinion of the sierra lunas i love them i love them because yeah. they solve a lot of problems and they end up costing less the only caveat is if you are very far away i would so they can hit full reference volume from 12 feet away they can get really close from 15 feet away, although not quite. The Sierra 2s can hit full reference volume at 15 feet away, so there's one difference. If you're more than 15 feet away, then I start to question. They, they might not be the right choice. If you want to hit full reference volume, if you don't care about full reference volume, they might be fine for that too. So that's really the only limitation is, is sheer output. Patrick says, a while back we explained how one speaker driver can play multiple frequencies at the same time. Could we go over that again? Well, that was a long, that's a short question with a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I tried to think of a, 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 an analogy or a, a way to picture this, and I think I came up right. with something pretty decent. Uh, okay, so now, the sandwich? No, it's not a sandwich. No. Dang it. It's uh, Sandwich analogy killed last week. It did. I got all kinds of compliments on that one. <laughs> so this is not a perfect analogy, but it might help you to just sort of picture a little bit of what's going on. So imagine you're in a big old parking lot, and imagine that someone has marked off a line along that parking lot every foot, right? And now you've got yourself a big stack of, like, solo cups, all right? And somebody says, okay, go out there and put a cup down 
on one of these lines every five feet. Okay, so every five feet, you put down a cup on a line. Now, that's pretty easy to picture, right? So that, that's your frequency. How often is a cup put down? Every five feet. There you go. That's one frequency. Pretty easy right. to picture. Now that same person tells you, okay, leave those cups every five feet, but now put down a cup every 10 feet. That's a different frequency, but you can pretty easily picture, okay, you go one, two, three, four, five, there's one cup. You go one, two, three, four, five, now there's two cups, right? Because you go, okay, I'm still putting down a cup every five feet, but I'm also putting down a cup every 10 feet. So now one, two, three, four, five, again, I'm 15 feet away, there's only one cup. One, two, three, four, five, 20 feet away, now there's two cups. So that's two right. different frequencies just overlapping each other, right? That's all that happened. Now you could say, okay, put down a cup every three feet. And that's going to create another new pattern on top, right? Because you're going to go one, two, three, there's a cup. Another two at five, there's a cup. And then you're going to go another one, there's another cup because you just, every three feet, there's a cup. And, but then once you get out to 15, you're going to have three cups because that's five, 10, and three, right? And so you're going to start forming this more complex pattern it's not just one cup every five or one cup every 10 because they overlap each other. There's going to be all the moments where those numbers match up and they overlap each other and you're going to end up with multiple cups on top of each other. So waves work this same way. You can add a frequency to an existing frequency. You can take away a frequency from one that was already a more complex wave where things were already overlapped and it doesn't matter all those individual frequencies are still individual frequencies unto themselves but they can all overlap and share the same space and right. when they do they just create a more complex pattern but so it's just a, an, a, an addition of multiple different frequencies so i think i think what what messes everybody up and, mm -hmm. and honestly it breaks my brain as well sure is the woofer goes in and out right right so in order for it to push a you know, uh, uh, let's say 60 hertz or whatever this wave, it goes in and out 60 times per second. 60 but then times at, a second, that's right. And the, but then when it's doing a 120, uh, no, uh, yeah, 120, mm -hmm. then it has to go, you know, 120 times a yep. second at the same time. Yep. So, you know, the, the, the driver is going in and out, but it's not just going in and out, you know, once, you know, it, you know, two times at the same moment, it's basically as it's going back and forth for the 60 hertz, it's got to be also doing extra vibrations for that 120 hertz and for the everything else that it's doing. But the way to think of it is you take the highest frequency that's that's being played. Right. And okay, so let's say it's 120 hertz that we're starting. It's moving in and out 120 times a second. That's fine. And now we say, okay, in addition to that 120 hertz sound, there's also a 60 hertz sound. Right. Now, what that's going to do is create a wave pattern that looks different. It's gonna be the two waves added together. Added together, right. And that's gonna create some places where it's extra high because mm -hmm. both of them were going out at the same time. And it's also gonna create some places where it's much lower than the original wave because at that particular moment, one of the waves was saying go out and the other frequency was saying go in. And they sort of cancel each other out and you end up with this, this little dip area. So. All you have to think of is that whatever the shape of the complex wave, right? We started with this one uniform wave at one frequency, then we added a different frequency and it changed the shape of the wave. So now some parts are extra high and some parts are extra low because we just added them together. Right. That shape of that wave is the in and out movement now. Mm -hmm. So it goes a little farther out at some places and some places it doesn't go out and sometimes it goes like out and then not all the way back in just a right. little ways back in and then out again because that's how the waves added together and that right. is the movement of the driver so it's not that the driver is constantly moving back and forth at 120 and then also moving back and forth at 60 it's right. that the those two movements got added together to create one more complex movement and that is the movement of the driver and the thing i find most fascinating about this is how in if you keep everything in the analog domain you don't have to actually understand any of it <laughs> you know basically <laughs> basically the uh the microphone that you're using the microphone we're using right now it is reacting the the mm -hmm. filament that's in there or the the diaphragm that's in there mm -hmm. is reacting to the sound pressure that we are creating with our mouths that's right and the, which being created in this room and everything else that's, that's right. going on so that complex wave is being formed by the movement of this of this diaphragm yep. which is then essentially you know uh, 
transformed into an electrical impulse, which then goes to an amplifier, you know, or in this case, it gets stored and sent over the internet and everything else. But, you know, if you think about this way, it goes into a, a record player, if we want to go vinyl, sure. and that causes the grooves to be carved the way they're carved. And then yep. when you play it back, you know, those grooves cause, cause the, the... The needle to diaph- be back and forth in, and then in the, the same pattern. The diaphragm of the woofer or the driver to move back and forth in exactly the same way that mm-hmm. the diaphragm on this uh microphone. on this microphone so yeah so i mean to, you to, don't have to really it's like it's it, it seems like magic it really does but <laughs> it's science but that's what it is but to, to go back to the cups in the parking lot imagine that after you've laid so you've laid down a cup every three feet you've laid down a cup every five feet you laid down a cup every 10 feet and that's created this more complex series of cups now you just drape a string over that right and that has created this sort of up and down pattern depending on how many cups were stacked at any given foot, right? At the at the 15 foot mark, it's going to be an extra tall hump for that string that you laid over top of all of these cups right. because three, five, and 10 all overlapped each other. That up and down movement, just imagine that's the in and out movement of the driver. And that right. that's how it works. It, it's, it's not that... You have multiple strings. There's just one string overlaying this pattern of cups that are telling it how high and how far to go up and down, and that translates exactly to in and out of the driver. It's a more complex shape, right. but that's all it is. 40 minutes, we're on question five. Okay, <laughs> just want to throw that out there. John on Twitter, what's the best TV for under $1,000? Well, I mean, if you said the best TV under 500 bucks, I'd say <laughs> TCL or Vizio. So TCL and TCL and uh, Vizio are going to be in this game, but I'm sure we can find some older models for you from some oh, of the other manufacturers. I didn't think that, that much. Under... <laughs> really? I was just like, thousand bucks, you can get a 65 inch TCL, or okay. at the moment, since we're coming up to Super Bowl, the Vizio P series. This is the 2018. The 2019s haven't come out yet. Uh, as we're recording this for future YouTube people who still can't figure out how dates work. Um, <laughs> 2018. Oh, you guys are so stupid. I saw one. The I Super saw, Bowl was three weeks ago. I saw one coming from the end of 2016 where we were talking about subwoofers. and like, how come you didn't recommend the Monoprice Monolith subwoofers? I'm like, because they literally didn't exist when we made this video. <laughs> that would be the reason. Um, but yes, uh, the Vizio P series from 2018, they're on sale right now. And you can get the 65-inch 2018 Vizio P series for $900 right now. So... That's my pick for under a thousand bucks. Um, the only differences I would make there were if you super duper care about variable refresh rate, because gaming is your number one thing and you've got an Xbox One X and you really, really care about variable refresh rate, uh, there is the Samsung Q6FN. Uh, you okay. could get that in a 55 inch size. Now, some people are going to say, what about the NU8000? It's even less. I like the Q6FN a whole lot more because the LCD panel itself has much higher contrast than Mm. the NU8000. And that makes a huge difference. So it's worth it to me, but you'd have to go down to the 55 inch size to get that one. And then of course, if you manage to up the budget to 1500, the 55 inch B8 OLEDs are on sale for $1,500 right now, but that is definitely not under a thousand and it'd be 55 inches. So thousand bucks, 65 inch Vizio P series. That's what I'd get. All right. Yeah. Matt. Matt would like to upgrade his self-proclaimed nightmare scenario. <laughs> so I have a feeling this nightmare scenario is like just let everybody's scenario. <laughs> We've all been here. He he is dealing with a small area, twelve feet by twelve feet seven inches by thirteen feet by eight feet nine inches. I guess that's the height. Hopefully, yeah, eight foot nine uh, is the height. Yes, but it's open to other rooms, including all the way upstairs. It's a living room first, a playroom first, three young kids second, and a theater area third. It's an older house, so cons- Ooh, I just clicked on something. So construction is uh, bricks exterior and lath and plaster interior. Lath, 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 lath. Yeah. We say lath. I don't know if everybody says lath, but that's what we say up here. Lath and plaster. Anyways, it's got boards and plaster. Yes. He's got no spare floor space whatsoever. His seats are pushed right against the back wall, and they aren't moving. There's a fireplace to the right, French doors to the left, and a large permanent opening in front. He set up his Paradigm Studio 40 V2 speakers at either side of the large opening, and a retractable projection screen comes down in front of the opening when it's movie time. He covers the windows behind the seats with a blackout curtain, and even though there's some ambient light from the room behind the screen, it works at the moment. He's moved... He moves his center speaker into position on a small stand when the screen is down, then moves it out of the way otherwise. So it's a 3.0 setup at the moment and really like to expand to surround. 
Okay. It's yep. a very, it's a nice, it's uh, hardwood floors, his area, his, his area, he's got uh, a window behind his head too. We didn't mention that. Yes, he did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he said, did he? said he put a curtain over that to block. Oh, a blackout curtain. Blackout That's right. Curtain, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, the speaker, yeah, I mean, he's done pretty good. There's a, I mean, there's it's a pretty part. clever idea that he's done here because he's got this opening that goes into what looks like his dining room. And right. he's like, well, can't put a TV in front of that, but retractable screen comes down, yeah. and there you go. Yeah. And he's got the projector on the mount hanging from the yep. ceiling hanging behind him. Ceiling. And he's got space on either side of his couch, it looks like. But I can't see. Is there a chair to the right so side of the couch? So there is a chair to what would be the right side of the couch, and that's very close to I'm the fireplace that's, a... that's over there on the right. Yeah, and there's some sort of end table on the and left. And then there's yeah, there's a table. Well, it's actually his equipment stand. He's got a record player on top of it, and he's got oh, his... Oh, is that one of those? Yeah, he's got his AV it. receiver and his source uh, in this little stand that's to the left of his couch. Uh, and then in other parts of the room, there's like some kids' play toys, because as he mentioned, it's a playroom second. They are. They must be very young, because he's got like the bouncy chairs he's got the that stuff. stuff that's yeah right. let me just take a little bit closer look here mm -hmm. yep so i mean okay. i i think you've you've done quite well with the available space uh and and everything that he mentioned makes sense it's like yeah probably not gonna be moving around seating or <laughs> where things go largely and where would you put a gigantic you know 18 inch subwoofer in here Right. Since it's open space to the rest of that. All right. His wife would prefer to no longer have large speakers on stands and a subwoofer, let alone two, is a total non-starter. <laughs> There's nowhere to put a sub for one thing. His wife already wishes the bass from just his large bookshelf speakers were was quieter. He can get a, a, a bit of chest thump from them. Uh, he, I, I guess that's just a statement. Mm -hmm. He can get a bit of chest thump from them. And for his taste, he'd like to hear well-integrated, optimized bass for the first time, but he'd like to be wowed by a change of speakers and some surround even more. He's considering mounting some JBL Pro speakers on either side of the big opening, or maybe even embedding them in the wall. He'd like to get the front right speaker out of the corner as much as possible. So he's thinking of shifting everything a bit to the left and even replacing his current screen with an acoustically transparent roll-down screen from a Loon Vision so that he could slide it down in front of the front left and right speakers. He's got all kinds of concerns about the ambient light from behind an acoustically transparent screen and whether on or in-wall speakers could extend as deep as his current Paradigm Studios. But bottom line, what do we think he should do up front? Could one of the, of the Atmos surround uh, sound bars even be an option? Okay, so... If you get the acoustically transparent screen, it's going to light, let light through. Okay, there's just so, no yeah, getting around he, that. He questioned it because the Loon Vision, he contacted them directly, and they're like, well, they have one with a very tight weave and a black backing. Uh, and according to them, exceedingly little, or they say no light is going to get through. And it's like, well... How the sound come through if the light's coming through? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you... which what's what's the smaller thing? I mean, come on, right? Yes, yeah. Go, go give me a break. So, yeah. It's light. Yeah. Light is going to come through. Come through. Uh, I mean, it can, it can be minimal. It can be not a lot, right? But uh, yeah, it, yeah, some light's going to come through. But I mean, so first of all, lath and plaster construction. So do we want to be even considering in walls in here? Because that ain't a trivial thing when no, this is not, not drywall. When it's lath and plaster construction, and I'm like, I'm not in favor of it trying to do in walls. Plus. What is to the right of his screen, to the right of the opening? I'm like, that's a load-bearing area, it looks like to me. <laughs> like, I really don't like the idea well, of in walls here. might be. Yeah, I would do on walls, uh, yes. but do the, something flat. On walls make a lot of sense to me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, that being said, uh, I don't know why I'm so itchy. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't have a lot of space in that. He does not right, have a lot of space. The, I mean, anywhere right. he doesn't have a lot of space yeah. here. Uh, I do like the idea of putting them... Now, as far as base is concerned, well, it just depends on the size of the on-walls, honestly, and, you know, how much you're willing to spend. You know, any... I've seen on-walls that are like... Well, I mean, those legacy audio ones are... I'm sure <laughs> they've got plenty. Huge, yes. Yeah, they're huge. they got plenty of base. Uh, I, I've dealt with this kind of construction before, and like Rob said, it is no trivial thing to put a yeah. hole in that wall. Um, you end up with sawzalls, and it's a it's a big mess. I the upside is that pretty much anywhere you want to screw something into that wall, you can. Sure, <laughs> you don't yes. have to. You have to look for studs or anything like that. But I'm I'm not super in favor of moving the screen over, going mm -mm. to acoustically transparent. Mm -mm. I'm like, I'd pretty much leave the screen where it is. I'd put some on wall speakers to either side of it. Um, well, the super birds would be the would be my first yeah, but you thing that would, that would pop. You can't get them anymore, but that would be my a really interesting choice because they're yeah. they are kind of big. They come off the wall a little bit, not not yeah. a huge amount, and but you can aim them. 
right. you know, which would give you right. a little bit of an ability but to you, tow them you, in. You can't get those anymore. That's not right. an option. I mean, my first thought, the first thing that popped into mind was Revel's uh, Concerta on walls. Okay. Um, they have their M10. They have their C10. Now, one thing I was also thinking is he's still going to need to put the center on like a stand, like that. It's right in front of the big opening. <laughs> So right. the Revel Concerta C10 uh, actually comes with a little base, an optional base or an on-wall mount. So that's right. convenient. That'll work. So form factor-wise, I like them because they're very slim. Uh, they do have a bracket, so you can aim them. Uh, right. But they're very, very skinny from left to right, and they would absolutely fit into his space. The thing is, they really don't play below 100 hertz. They absolutely mm. do not. They, uh, they, they claim well, the spec is... your base problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's just it. They claim the spec is 110, and that is that is very honest. I'm like, yeah, they, they put out nothing below on Earth. So I was like, well, if a subwoofer is truly a no-go, I could definitely get behind on the low side of the price, uh, Ascend's HTM200 SEs. What was his price? What was that? Did he give us a he price? He didn't give us a budget, so I don't know how much he's willing to spend. So huh. uh, I, was, I was first thinking, like, if you want to keep the price on the lower end, Ascend's HTM200 SEs. That, that would definitely right. work. That's one option. Now, what they have to mount them onto a wall on the back is just a couple of threaded inserts. So that right. normally that would go on maybe like a ball jointed type of wall thing. But if you want, if you, they can still be flush mounted. You just need a, a flush mount bracket that would mm. uh, uh, screw in with a couple of inserts. Or we mentioned them before, before, if you've got a lot more money to spend, the Sierra Lunas would be a fantastic choice. He said he wants to be wowed if you're willing to spend how much Sierra Luna's cost, which 1200 is 1200 bucks. I yeah, think, 1150. Yeah. Uh th that'll wow you in terms of sound quality and bass-wise, I mean, I, you know, 60 hertz is not first. great, but that's yeah. about what you're getting out of your bookshelves now anyway. Yeah. Um I'm going to suggest you just for I mean, if you look at this couch uh -huh. and the couch is very small. Now, there's a chair that's in the corner right there, but the couch is small. The couch, 100% of that couch, is between those two speakers. It is, yeah. Why do we need to have a center at all? Yeah. Why don't we go phantom center? You and you can test that center. right now. Yeah. Just, just take tell your receiver just, you do not have a center. I don't channel. have a center. That's right. And then see what it sounds like. Yeah, that's Because that's I'm betting you're not going to notice a huge difference, if any. In which case, this upgrade can very easily go from you know basically it can it, it, it save you quite a bit of money yeah and you're not going to lose that much of performance or you could put um, it towards like if a pair of, <clears throat> of sierra lunas is the max you could possibly spend maybe you only need a pair you don't also need the center yeah. exactly which would save now you about neither bucks. of us is thinking soundbar here right where would you place it on on the <laughs> stand? You'd have to move it in and out of position every oh, time you want to use it. Oh, that's a nightmare. Yeah, it's too. First of all, it, especially an Atmos sound bar, it's you know it's meant to be at a certain height. Yes, and your ceiling is meant to be at a certain height so that it can bounce sound to you, yeah. which is what it's doing. And it being almost on the floor <laughs> and or and God on a forbid, stand and with a big space behind it because it's just yeah, open. No, neither of us no. is thinking soundbar here. So soundbar is not a is pair not of an nice on wall speakers. And yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, I'd go ascend here because either way, if you can't have a subwoofer, as much as I like the form factor of those Revels, I, it's not quite right. Uh, RBH's Ultra Ones as well, as flat and awesome as the form factor is, really do not play below 100 hertz. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there you go. Yeah, I like the Lunas here. Honestly. Oh, if you if can afford them, would, if you can afford them, I like the be, Lunas here. I mean, twelve hundred bucks is not tr not a trivial amount, but yeah. uh, you know, you're getting you're sitting close enough that you'll be able to get oh, everything yeah. you want. Oh, yeah. And you're I hate to break it to you, but probably ninety percent of your wife's problems with your sound is how big these speakers are. Yep. And getting something considerably smaller is a fantastic yep. idea. <laughs> Plus, you can get them in a super nice finish. That's a bamboo, real bamboo cabinet. It's like, Let her pick, man. There's like five different look, finishes on that website. They can look so, gorgeous. They're teeny yeah. tiny. Yeah, they just yeah. cost a bit. But you want to be wowed by sound, <clears throat> you'll be wowed by their sound. So he says, what should he do for surround speakers? He, he actually owns a pair of Paradigm ADP surrounds. They're large enough that the only place he could mount them was on the back wall on either side of the windows behind the seats. And he didn't like the results when he tried that, although he isn't sure if that's because they're dipoles or because they're just too close to his ears with that positioning. Regardless, what do we, uh, what do we recommend now? Again, I'm going to recommend an on-wall speaker, and I'm going to yeah. recommend... It. Now, the problem... I mean, I have to scroll back up to look at this. Uh, you have space on your on your side walls to mount these things. If you, if you get something small and wall yes. mountable then yes 
I 100% do not recommend getting a dipole speaker yeah. in this situation or a bipole speaker for that Agreed. matter. Yep. You just want to have very small, you know, facing each other, basically, mm-hmm. speakers on the side They can even they be... be angled slightly back towards the back wall. Like right. they're on the sides right. to your sides and angled even a little bit back towards the back wall. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, the problem with the, your last placement almost certainly was because they were too big and you were getting yeah. one half of the sound yeah. shot directly into your face yep. because of the angles of those speakers. I I imagine they're, tra- they're like trapezoidal. Yeah, points, they're, right? yeah they're that, that type of yeah. thing with the angled sides, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's just not appropriate for here. You need to sell all these speakers and mm. fund. You you sell all this stuff, mm-hmm. you're going to be able to fund most of these the, the, the speaker choices we're talking about here. Now, if you did go Luna's up front, I mean, honestly, you could go Luna for Lunas. And <laughs> well, do that's, it, but that's that's some that's pricey o- stuff that's, that's around. That's yeah. Rob overkill right yep. there. But if you've got the cash, uh, which you probably don't, because you got three young kids. But if you've got the cash, then that's that would be a you know perfect yep. uh, perfect timbre match all the way around the room. And Rome. we would have been going Focal Little Birds when they were available, yes. but they're not yeah. anymore. However. As Mark let us know, uh, he does have those Boston acoustics, the Soundware 4.5s, mm-hmm. which are extremely similar fine. in form factor yeah. to the Focal Little Birds. So, yeah, I could recommend those all day because it'd be super easy to mount and aim them. Right. And uh, very affordable was $105 for a pair of them. And there you go. You got some surrounds. And uh, looking at the picture, these look like teeny tiny little Bose cubes or something. They are actually bigger than you might imagine. That's a four and a half inch woofer in there. So it's not right. it's not that teeny tiny. It's not one of the little two inches. Yeah, just be aware. So his anthem receiver and sources live in a small stand to the in the rear left corner. He already owns some uh, Bryson and ATI amp. Dude, you do not need any of that. Where did you come from? <laughs> <laughs> he had stuff before. Clearly, I guess so. Yes. Apparently, he had a really big room and a lot of money. So <laughs> Bryson and ATI amplifiers that are in the in the basement, awaiting the, the day when he can construct a dedicated theater. Despite previously saying that a subwoofer is a non-starter, if he were to undertake the job of moving most of the gear into the basement, wiring it there from his living room, that would open the, the rear left corner for a sub. Although he'd want a sub that could live under a table so that he could still put his sources on top in that scenario. Should he consider doing all of that? Should, uh, should he still target something like a ported PP3000 because of the, Oh my God! Well, he was, he's, thinking the you. Whole, he's thinking the whole house. Is that the only way to do this? <laughs> or the small sealed stub, sub right beside his seat in that corner would be something he could optimize along with smaller on one speakers to deliver a really great experience. Um, yeah, if you're going to put it that close to your seat, I would 100% get a small sealed subwoofer. You're never... First of all, you do not have the room for a PB2000 in this it's room. No. <laughs> not a, not no. a chance. No, sir. Even if you and moved all of that out of the way and all that. And no. What table would you put on top of it? It'd have to be a piano. <laughs> because... <laughs> Do you have space for a piano in this room that I'm not seeing? Because that's not a that's not a, the small sub. You, yeah, um, there are actually I saw a couple of places that you could theoretically put subs in here, and yes, that yeah. was one of the places. Okay. First of all, who sits in that chair to the to your right? Hmm. Is, does anybody ever sit in that chair? Is it like a breastfeeding chair? You're which I would be completely okay chair? with. No. Well, if you can, if no one ever sits in the chair, or you can get, throw some beanbags on the floor for the kids to, you know, to, to watch on and get rid of that chair. I get rid of the chair and put the sub there. Uh, that's great. Up front, just uh, to the. Let me see here. Let me find to the, the picture. left of the opening. I mean, there's uh, there's stuff there. I don't know. There's stuff there, anyways. That little. Uh, that little what is it stove toy thing next yeah. to the bookshelf? Yeah, that you know that can be accidentally thrown away or something, <laughs> or moved to another room somehow. Right, if you are a wall mounting your your speakers where your left speaker or, in fact, your right speaker currently is, both of those are subwoofer locations. Um, but yeah, if you can get rid of that chair or move some of your gear downstairs, I don't know. Why aren't oh. we just talking about building the? Building the basement. The, the, the basement out. <laughs> Why aren't we doing the, that? I think is the idea. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, but I mean, honestly, subwoofer wise, what, what do we think? At most, like an SB1000? Oh, at most. Maybe yeah. like this, uh, an RSL Speedwoofer 10S. Anyway, if your wife really hates this stuff, I, know. I mean, butt kick her, you know, and just yeah. shake your couch a little bit. Yeah. You know, that there. I mean, if you went with the Ascend speakers and a butt kicker, 
it's not the same as having a subwoofer right. pressurizing your room, but we know that we knew going in, that's not what we're going after here. I could dig that. You know, I would have a little difficulty if you're going with the Revel on walls. I would have a little difficulty if you're going even with the RBH on walls as much as I like them. They really are base shy. There's no question about that. But right. if you go with the Ascends that we recommend, it's like, yeah, you're getting some nice sound down to at least 60 hertz. You add a butt kicker, that's kind of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I know, I, I I think what he's thinking is that he's going to keep all the rest of this gear and then someday build a nice big home theater. Yeah, you know, in his basement or That's something right. like that. And I, I I I hey, I support you 100. percent You probably don't need the amps. If you end up getting these Lunas or some you know something similar, you might end up thinking I'm never going back to these paradigms anyways. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're going to be a completely different experience. Um. And I, I, this is going to hurt to say, I'm sorry in advance to say it, but I think you should just get rid of all of it. Just sell it all. Get yourself a nice little system up here with a nice little receiver that can do all the mm -hmm. stuff that it needs to do. Get rid of the amps. And basically, you're going to be out of pocket nothing. Then, when it comes time to build your theater downstairs, you need three front speakers because you've now got four speakers for your surrounds and surround mm -hmm. backs which would be with whatever you've gotten in here. And then, or they end up being overhead speakers for your Atmos. Or we just, and we cross that bridge when we come to it because yeah, yeah. worrying about future plans, uh, we know from experience, pretty much never works out the way you're envisioning right yeah. now. I'm sitting here between, you know, two uh, uh, tower speakers that I wish I had gotten bookshelves <laughs> because I really don't need these things. They're just too big and they're in the way. So I would highly recommend you just start from scratch. Get yeah. rid of it all. Because it's it's all you're gonna get good prices for it. Yeah. So yeah, if you know. you're not gonna put it to use right now, you might as well get something for it, and we'll we'll cross whatever bridge we need to when we get there. That's right. And think how happy your wife will be. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm selling it all uh, because I love you, honey. That's and right. Not because the <laughs> if you rent guys told me to. Juan on Twitter. Juan noticed that a certain Emotiva amplifier bottles are available on Amazon. They're the same price uh, as on Amazon's own web. I'm mean, sorry, Emotiva's own website, but shipping from Amazon with some Amazon Prime would be faster. So is there any ra any reason to avoid ordering from Amazon? Nope. <laughs> None whatsoever. They are officially a dealer. Uh, Emotiva even put it in their FAQ that mm -hmm. they're like, where can you buy Emotiva products? They're like, we have some retail dealers in some locations. Yep. Yep. You can buy it directly from us or you can buy it from Amazon. Those are the three places. Like, well, Amazon's one of them. So it's not like you're worrying about you're not going to have a warranty or something. When it's right. shipped and sold by Amazon, it's fully authorized. And you're right. The prime shipping will be faster than ordering it from Emotiva, who's like, yeah, it'll be like a one or two week wait if you order from us. So uh, have at it. The only thing I would say is if you're looking at the XPA series of amplifiers, which are definitely some of the models that are listed there on Amazon. Uh, the Monoprice Monolith amplifiers are also sold through Amazon, and they're a little bit less expensive. So <laughs> I'll just muddy the waters with that in there. There you go. I want to go back to, what's his name? The, the last guy we were talking about, uh, Matt. Yeah. So one thing I'm looking at here, and I just thought of it because I looked up at my own prime elevation speakers. Oh, yes. prime ele As your uh, surrounds? As a surrounds, uh -huh. and he could actually use them as his fronts as well. If you, re I mean, it's non-optimal. Well, you could non -optimal. go prime you... satellites. Actually, that's another option. S that's another option too. So look at the prime elevation speakers. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think prime is... elevations of surrounds. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So let's. Gotcha. let's sorry about that. That just popped into. Not at all. It's a good suggestion. Uh, where are we at? Eight. So, David. Yeah. David says our advice led him to getting his Denon X4300H receiver and SVS Ultra Book shelf and center speakers with prime elevation speakers and his PB12 Plus subwoofer. But he got that on sale. So he says his theater wouldn't have been the same without us, so he's giving us kudos for the help. He's got the upgrade bug, though. Mm -hmm. He's quite happy with the aforementioned setup. The room is roughly 15 by 25 by 7, but it's not a perfect rectangle, so there's a bit of a hallway and a bit of an open area to the left. It's closed off in the rest of the house, though, so it's about 2,900 cubic feet total. Since the left side is, is kind of open, his prime elevation speakers went on the back wall as surround backs, and he has in-ceiling RSL speakers acting as his surrounds, about three feet behind the seats in the ceiling. He sits about 13 feet from his 75-inch Sony X... 13 feet? 75-inch Sony X900E. So let me take a look at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's sort of a... I would call it an offset rectangle. So right behind... Like a few feet behind his couch, the entire room shifts about... 
sure. two feet yeah. to the left, yeah. <laughs> basically. You know, yeah. so there's a there's a there's a little. It, 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 it's not really. I mean, there is a hallway that's open on the left, but it, it's it's. But there are doors on it, and that and that left side is not totally open. You know, so it, the the theater area is not 100 percent of this space, but it's close to being a rectangle, and it is closed off from the rest of the house. So we're not dealing with infinity cubic feet. Right. He's got a fireplace on his left. Mm -hmm. He's got the surround speakers above him in the ceiling and behind him a little bit. And the surround backs are on the wall, back wall. There are subs in the front right corner. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay. Yeah. There we go. That's right. right. Oh, and here's pictures. I didn't see the pictures. (laughs) And it's all very white and gray. And and flat and and hard. And flat (laughs) and hard. That's right. No absorption anywhere from what we can see. No, no. He's got a couple ideas in mind. A second sub. His wife would love for the huge black pb12 plus to be out of sight so she's open to adding a white subwoofer in the current spot while moving the pb12 plus behind the couch the only other place for a second sub could go would be the front wall to the left of the tv to make it look symmetrical don't do that his own the only subs dave has found with a white finish are smaller sealed models so would any of these work well when paired with the pb12 plus what should he do you should paint your pb12 plus oh that's (laughs) that is an option I mean, I wouldn't it, do it myself, but that's me. Well, I mean, it, it's it it, it 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 could be as easy as draping some white mm, cloth. acoustically transparent fabric over the top of this thing. It's not going to stop the airflow. It's not going to stop the driver from moving. Just drape it over the top of it, and that's it. I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, Clint and I were. I just met with Clint for lunch a little a little couple days ago, last week, week before. And uh, we were talking about the exact same thing. This guy was like, one of his friends had all these speakers and stuff that he had gotten from Clint from one thing or another. And the guy was like, oh, I'm going to, I got to get rid of all these because I need white speakers. And he was like, just paint them. Yeah. <laughs> just paint them. I mean, it, literally, you could just paint them. It's it, just the outside. It's just yeah. the outside. It's not going to affect the performance at all. And you just got to paint the three three sides you can see. Actually, two <laughs> sides because one of them is almost certainly a grill, right? You yep. can leave the rest of it black. Hey. I mean, I'd paint it. It doesn't get him a second true. sub, though. What do we do? It doesn't. That's true, but we can still talk about that. But I, I, yeah. I so just paint it. I mean, I'm in agree. Usually, when you go looking for white subs, uh, they are small and they are sealed. It, hardly anybody makes their larger models in white for whatever reason. Uh, some people mentioned that SPS has started offering the SB2000 in white, but that's not really a match for your PB12 plus. Right. Uh, although the PB12 Plus can be run in a sealed mode, right? Sure. Uh, but that'd, that'd be like an, an SB Plus at that point. Yeah. Um, so they don't come in white, but they do come in various finishes. And I'm like, I'm looking at his front entertainment center. I'm like, well, that's not a white entertainment center. That's kind of a, sure a wood grain type of look to it or something like that. Right, and I'm like, well, what if something kind of matched or complemented that? Because Power Sound Audio, of all people, who make very, very large subwoofers, uh, but they do offer some different finish options in real woods. Uh, okay. One of which, like the Natural Cherry, is is you know quite light in color. It's certainly not white, but it's quite light. Now they only offer it on their sealed 15 inches, but it's a sealed 15 incher or a dual 15 inch driver. Oh, <laughs> yeah, dual opposed. So the two wood drivers are on opposite ends of each other, but uh, oh, they God. have these different finish options from power sound audio. I'm like, so it's not white, but it might complement the decor in a I, real wood. Finish. I always expect at some point we're going to hear reports of a power sound audio, f- you know, structural failure of a subwoofer and it just explodes. <laughs> you know, it just, just the, the just pressure within just apart. just rips itself apart. Well, I was also <laughs> thinking, just... you know, the the other thing you could do is you could buy Power Sound Audio's dual 18 inch vented one, and then when your wife divorces you, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> there you go. Because that thing, that is a divorce monster. I'm showing an yeah. image of it in the complete. The other, video. you know, what, and and <laughs> don't be afraid to call. Oh, yeah. You know, there's no, no reason why you can't call SVS yeah. or any of these companies, any of them. Because they do have a white finish option on some models, which means they can probably make, I mean, it might cost a bit extra. But right, can, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah, it costs a little bit extra, but you're like, okay, well, I'll take a, you know, a PB2000 and can you too. give it to me white? R- rhythmic, yeah, rhythmic too. Rhythmic yeah. has started offering some white options only on their smaller models, but they have the ability to make the white cabinet, so they could probably custom make something in one of their larger models. Yeah, so yeah. plenty, plenty of ways to come at this. 
So he says expand to Atmos. He already pre-wired for front height speakers and he wired for an additional pair of insulin speakers that will be three to four feet in front of his current seated positions. Any thoughts? Well, is there any yeah. way we can get surround speakers that aren't in the ceiling? Because those are yeah. already in the perfect position to be your top rears. I know. Yeah. I uh, I am in complete agreement with that. There's, I, I mean, there's no, there's nothing on the left wall. That's part of his problem. There is, there's no left wall there. Yeah, there's opens. no real left wall there. And what would be the ideal place looks like there's even a. It's hard to see because the uh, the diagram is cut off, but it looks like there's a door right there. Yeah. Like, it'd be farther away, and it's a door, so that's not great. Right. So, the prime elevation speakers, again, in yeah. here, if, if, this, if, there's, if there's a door, you could put it above there. Uh -huh. so that's basically, you know, what uh -huh. I did with my... Uh, that would be a good place for surrounds. Yes. And then... What is currently your in-ceiling surrounds, you call top rears. And then you do top fronts. And yet, yeah, you already wired for top fronts, three to four feet in front of you, and the ceiling is perfect for top fronts. Now you have top fronts and top rears. Didn't this guy already say he had prime elevation speakers? Yeah. Where are these prime yeah, elevation they're on the speakers? We don't have a picture of the oh, back. Oh, they're the there, back so wall. They're, they're on the, the back, back wall. wall. They're his surround yeah. backs. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm in agreement with that, 100%. Uh, do we want him to get some acoustic treatments? That's probably oh a, God. a visual mm -hmm. no-go, but we would love you to have some if it's yeah. there's any way to do it. I mean, you've got a picture on the wall. Let's kill two birds with one stone. You take that image, you put it on a printed panel, and now you've got, well, one, but more. Get more. But, get more uh, printed <laughs> panels. <laughs> more printed panels. Yes. You, like, and, and you know, I'm seeing these even at Sam's now. They, they're selling like these three packs of pictures uh -huh. that are like, you know, the, uh, the beach or something, and you hang them like You're right, right, either yeah. right next to each other they or make a in little sequence mini or whatever. Mural type of thing, yeah. Yeah, do that on that right wall yeah. behind those chairs, but acoustic panels. Yes, instead. printed panels. You know, uh, Very uh, much so. They don't have to look uh, ugly. They can yeah, look above like above your artwork. fireplace. Yeah. You could put something there to the left of your. Where are the speakers? The front speakers. Uh, they are in the entertainment cabinet. Uh, oh so there's God. like the center that's in the little nook right in the middle below the TV. And then to the left and right, there are also little nooks and there are bookshelves lying sideways. Uh, they is in there. Not optimal, but whatever. That's okay. Right. Steve the Geek from Next Gen Home Theater on Twitter. Uh, Steve the Geek. What do we suggest for a wireless headphone solution for the living room? He's got some old RF headphones, but he isn't happy with their sound quality. He tried plugging his Audio-Technica M50X headphones into his Xbox One controller, but it was all a bit clunky, and he had some glitches and dropouts. It's so weird. That is a bit controller. weird. That's not good to hear, but yeah. such, such is life. Yeah. He'd be fine with plugging his AV receiver into a wireless transmitter and plugging his M50X headphones into a wireless receiver headphone amp. So what do we suggest? Well, the Sennheisers, I've actually just, I don't know where I got them, but I was there was like this bag in my corner, and I was looking for something else. I was like, what's in this bag? And they're like wireless Sennheiser headphones. Yeah, that, but that's pretty much uh, what he already has. Right, and he doesn't like them, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of them either. Like, you, you put them on, you power them up, and it's like, shh. Oh, you get that nice hiss. Yep. Yeah. My brother uses some something like that, and he actually loved i mean he's autistic so maybe he's not the most discerning listener but i have i have put it on them i thought that they were pretty comfortable oh yeah and they did they i, I didn't they function they're his. comfortable i just don't yeah. like the noise floor on them that's all uh yeah a long cord <laughs> oh you, you that, i already asked about that he's like nope that's that's out he doesn't want the long cord so okay uh since you are willing to plug an output from your AV receiver into a transmitter i would point you to aventry because they have their Bluetooth low latency, and that's key. The low latency really is kind of necessary, or otherwise right. it, it doesn't work so great. But they have their Bluetooth low latency. Uh, they have a little transmitter that they call the Audi Cast, uh, which can actually cast to two Bluetooth receiving devices, including you could have it send Bluetooth to your sound bar and Bluetooth to your headphones or two pairs of headphones. Does or he whatever. have a sound bar? I don't know. No, I'm just saying for anyone else. You know, oh. thinking about it, it's two Bluetooth receiving devices from one Audi cast from Aventry. And then they have their own little uh, Bluetooth low latency receiving slash headphone amplifier unit that they call the Clipper Pro. Uh, okay. Now, the one thing there is the Clipper Pro is not tremendously powerful. If you have a difficult to drive headphones, they're not going to get super loud. But the Audio Technica M50X I was gonna is say the M50s easy to drive. Are not, not exactly the hardest headphones That's right. to drive. But, just in case other people are looking at it. It is a small little unit. The battery does only last about four hours, but for a movie, that's fine. Oh. Well, you should just be able to plug the thing in, too. You right? can. Yeah, you can recharge it. Keep it plugged in. 
Uh, Reggie. Yeah, I uh, guess. Oh, the only one I would mention is uh, Astro Gaming is a good solution too, because um, their okay. their their gaming headsets are wireless and they work really well. So okay. Astro Gaming as well. Reggie. Reggie bought a new SVS PB1000 sub to replace his Klipsch R12. He's using an Onkyo 676 receiver. When he plugged his new uh, SVS sub and played the trim level test tone, he could barely hear anything coming out of the new subwoofer, whereas his old Klipsch sub was very loud. What's the deal? Is that normal? I uh, plugged this new and played the, played the trim level test. What's yeah. the volume control on the back set to? I mean, and what's the volume control on the AV receiver set to? Because the trim level... It yeah. shouldn't, but it does change with the volume dial on the AV receiver as well. So did you just have your AV receiver turned down when you played yeah. the test tone? Because that would do this, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, you want to make sure the volume dial on your Onkyo is turned up so that the volume is at 0 dB, as long as you're looking at the relative volume scale where most of the numbers are negative numbers, and then it at the top of the scale is 0 dB. You want it right. there before you run the test tone, and you, of course you want to make sure the volume dial on the back of the SVS subwoofer is, normally they tell you turn it up about halfway to start. Sometimes that's very loud. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so it isn't normal. It shouldn't be like a super quiet nothing. Right, 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 right. But as long as the volume dial is on both, uh, I will also say make sure that uh, they're on the back of the SVS sub. There is a crossover knob. Uh, make sure mm -hmm. that, that that is turned all the way as far clockwise as it can possibly go. Usually to d bypass. Or yeah, it actually says on there. And there is one of the inputs on the back that is labeled LFE. Uh, right. So plug into there. So yeah, make sure you're plugged into the LFE input. The crossover knob is turned all the way clockwise as far as it'll go. Start with the volume dial halfway or lower uh, and make sure the volume dial on your Onkyo is turned up to zero dB. Uh, and if it still is super duper quiet, then there's something wrong. Uh, give SVS right. a call. They will definitely take care of you. Nick. Nick heard us discussing how if you want to connect a separate amplifier to your AV receiver, it's preferable to be able to assign which speakers are powered by the external amp and which speakers are powered by the AV receiver's built-in amps. But how do you know if your AV receiver is able to do that? Uh, well, the manual will tell you. That's for sure. That's pretty much That's pretty much it. I mean, this came up because, um, what was the brand we were talking about? It's one of the higher end brands. Uh, where it had five amps built in, but it was capable of doing like 11 speakers, but the five built-in amps were always going to be your front, left, right, center. Well, I mean, the same thing happened with my Denon. You can either power the left, front, left, right speakers with a two-channel amp, or you can do Atmos surround middles or but surrounds. A, like, in that yeah. case, like all the pre-outs are always hot, Yeah. but you're saying which two out of these 11 must be powered externally. Right. Which isn't quite the same thing as like assigning everything, but it's it's along those lines. Because like in your case, right, you wanted to power nine of your speakers uh, using your AV receiver, and right. you only wanted to power two externally. And what was it? The front, the top middles, or the front heights? Top or something? middles. Top middles. Top middles. Top middles you were, were hoping to. I but wanted that to wasn't do the front option. heights, <laughs> but or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, you wanted to left. do the front heights, but it yeah. had to be the top middles that were external yeah. power. Yeah. Yeah, it was just weird. But yeah, unfortunately, but, yeah. So you, most AV receivers, not most, but many AV receivers, if you are using it as a preamp, this is not an issue because yes, all, all all the, the outputs are hot. hot at all times. So you right. plug in the amp and you don't plug anything into the to the amplifier channels and it uh, or the the speaker binding posts. Yeah, and it, it's not powering anything because there's nothing to be powered. Remember, it's it's the power is pulled from the amplifier. It's not. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not pushing power out constantly, but the signal is always there in the pre-outs. Uh, the only time you really have to worry about this is when you're ad adding an extra amplifier channel for right. additional things that um, your receiver can't power itself. That's right. So if you have a seven channel receiver and you say, I'm going to power my front left and rights with an amplifier, well, you plug your front, you plug the, the pre-outs into the amplifier, you plug, your, you, you run the speaker wire from the amplifier to the amp, to the speakers and the the AV receiver doesn't know what the heck's going on. Well, I mean, care. the the if it plugged in the pre outs, that'll work. But there might be another pair of speakers somewhere that aren't getting any power at all anymore because right. it wasn't an option to to uh, to assign the built in amplifiers to those particular right. pair of speakers, which is exactly what Tom ran into. So yeah, I mean, really, uh, you know, since you haven't said what brand and model that you're considering or what you already have, you you just have to read the manual. And it isn't going to spell it out in really nice, easy-to-understand language, 
right? You're going to have to look at the settings thing and it's going to be like, okay, what is the amplifier assign options? Right. And it, yeah, it can be a whole rigmarole, but there's, there's not really any other way to tell ahead of time. Uh, pretty much everyone does put their manuals online for you to peruse and you might have to do a little bit of sleuthing. So Nick, this is a different Nick. A different this Nick. one's Nick a. from from the UK. Mm-hmm. Currently experiencing bre- Brexit and Brexit. all of its glory. A few episodes ago, Nick told us about his setup, which includes an older Yamaha receiver, Kef R series speakers, BK electric sub, and a 48 inch Samsung HDTV. And now wants up. He now wants to upgrade to 4K Atmos. Uh, but wanted to do so piece at a time. He asked what order he should buy, uh, should buy the new TV receiver and Ultra HD Blu-ray player. So naturally, Tom's answer was to start by upgrading the sub. <laughs> nope. That doesn't sound like me. He's like, I want three new things. <laughs> None of those, new sub. That was Tom. <laughs> <laughs> He was thinking about how to make the upgrade to dual sub. Well, first of all, though, Tom wanted him to upgrade existing BK electric sub right off the bat. His base is definitely not uniform from seat to seat right now, so we appreciate the upgrade. But his wife has made it clear that two gigantic black boxes is out of the question in order to get two subwoofers across the room from each other. One of them would have to be go behind the sofa, and there's only an eight-inch gap back there. Mm. He was considering a s- slim sub like what Kef offers in their T series but would it be a good idea to mix and match subs or should they be identical and if not the slim calf t-series sub what else would we recommend or should he blow a thousand pounds on a new single sub to play to replace his pka electric keep in mind that a giant S, uh, uh, svs box is never going to happen let me look at this bk electric right so the bk here. electric it's a 12 inch peerless driver which is a, a good quality yep. driver uh what is it three or four hundred watts in the thing that threw me about this thing cube. was their their specifications were like yeah you didn't like the specs but i mean looking at the parts and the construction i mean it's basically an svs sb1000 yeah uh in in terms of the the specifications and its physical size it's a sealed cube about the same size as an sb1000 about the same weight same size driver similar powered uh, amplifier. So, I mean, an SB1000, we're, we like that a lot. It just depends on your room size. Yeah. What, threw, what, what really threw me was with their frequency response at negative <laughs> 3 dB. This is what it says on their website. Yeah, verbatim. Yeah. In your room, negative 3 dB lower than 20 hertz. You didn't say in your front point, room? Esc- you like that front room. In your room. front room. Yeah, yes. in your front room. Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Real professional there, guys. <laughs> just absolutely killed it. Um, yeah, I, I'll walk back my statements about this sub. This is probably a perfectly fine sub. <laughs> I mean, it depends. Uh, on, we don't situation. know. We still don't know his room size. That's yeah. That's a that's that's thing. a big big factor here. We don't know what what room we're. But let's with. just talk in general about matching, mixing and matching subs. Okay. You know, when we talk about mixing and matching subs, it is not at all necessary for you to timbre match your subwoofers. Oh God, you no. can't <laughs> you can't tell the difference between one twenty hertz sub and another 20 hertz sub when they're both playing the 20 hertz it's just not something that we're going to be able to discern so what is important to match though is their abilities right okay if you've got one sub that can play down to 35 hertz and one sub that can play down to 20 hertz your problem there is you've got dual subwoofers from 80 to 35 Mm -hmm. and then you've got a single sub from 35 on down yeah so you're the problems that you were trying to overcome, which is uniformity from seat to seat, well, you haven't fixed it. You fixed it up to thir- down to thirty five, and even that past becomes that, a, a little bit iffy because you get into some weirdness in that thirty five to twenty hertz, and then a yeah. little bit above that range, right? It gets a little bit weird. So, so what you're really looking to do here is to get another sub with similar capabilities yeah, they don't have to literally be identical no that's not necessary so i mean i don't know what your sub can do because i don't know how, how many exclamation po- <laughs> how many exclamation points it takes to get you all the way down to negative 20 or to 20 right. hertz so i but mean like, i would be a little surprised if you got say an sb1000 and they were worlds apart no i that, would be uh, uh, I, I would be surprised as yeah well. that yeah. that would seem odd to me because they're they're quite similar in design and specification not identical but so right but he's saying he's only got this eight inch gap behind his seat if he were going to put them across the room from one another and have to go behind his couch and there's only eight inches back there i'm like well i mean i wouldn't pair what he has with the kef t series i right. wouldn't get the kef t series full stop <laughs> so that kind of answers that one for me um 
I mean, could he put both of them up at the front of the room and deal with having to play with the phase knob? You know, I oh mean, my that's God. his wife is going to divorce him. Yeah. Um, or, or could we just go back to what he originally wanted to do, which was to keep the one subwoofer he has and focus on the other parts of his system? So he's got a 48 inch Samsung HDTV, which means yeah, 1080p. Something. 1080p, something like that, the Kefar series. You know, he wants to get an OLED. He wants to get, uh, you know, a new AV receiver that can do Atmos, um, which we already talked about. You'd have to go higher up because we want you to have four overheads, not only two. Um, Yeah. Right, but he's only got eight inches behind his head anyways. Yeah. (laughs) We've just now learned that. That's true. A little piece of information. They're going to be top middles for sure. Yeah, top middles and top and and front heights. Front heights, Um, yeah. Top middles, front heights, yeah. So I, I guess if you ended up keeping the sub and not getting the second sub, which yeah. you know, fine. Yeah. Uh, again, I mean, I think your your receive the limiting factor is not the Ultra HD Blu-ray player. That is the, oh, the that least come expensive later. purchase that can come later, for yeah, sure. out of everything you've got right now. So I'd go with the TV. You know, get the, get the TV and not worry about the Atmos or the. Um, Sure. The subwoofer for right I mean, you're now. gonna you're gonna notice a big, beautiful HDR TV. Yeah. That you're gonna notice that right away. There's no question about that. Um, yeah. So I mean, the only way I would do the subs across the room from each other is I'd have to move that seat. And I mean, if you got like an SB1000, it's not that big. I know you're gonna get with well, an extra four inches. Yeah. You know, five inches maybe forward on the couch you move, you move the seat a little closer which is nicer for your tv viewing experience anyway and that thing's probably smaller small enough that you, are you sure you can't fit it like beside the couch someplace yeah you know so that that could match quite nicely um it's not i mean if your room is fairly large it's not going to have enough output to completely pressurize but your current well, sub doesn't that anyways so yeah yeah we Same really though. still do need to know the dimensions of this room yeah <laughs> you know? not just the theater area the, the whole open space yeah we open. need to yeah, just draw on a napkin man we deal with this stuff all the time yeah. people are like it's kind of looks like this I'm like okay yeah, that's right. oh, oh that's rough fine. idea yeah rough idea tap this was tapping but he says just call him tap it's easier because <laughs> we don't pronounce we were names. messing up tapping yeah well uh, that still is probably wrong it's just, just so you know who we're talking about. I have no idea who this guy is. As a reminder, Tap is in the process of having a brand new house built from the ground up. His general contractor works with an AV installer. So Tap is having discussions and trying to decide on what approach you'd like to take when it comes to whole house audio distribution, various AV setups in several rooms, voice control, home automation, how everything's going to be controlled. He's willing to pay good money where it makes sense and provides good value. And, but he leans towards saving money where he can because he's a human being. That's yep. not made of money. <clears throat> Excuse me. Naturally, the approach the installer wants to take us put everything in a big rack system out of sight in the basement. Use HD base T to, and Ethernet to run the signals everywhere and to set up a control four system or something similar to control and automate the whole house. It would be expensive. And that uh-huh. is probably an understatement because, uh, yeah. On the opposite end, TAP is very comfortable with IT and networking, so he will be uh, setting up his own rock-solid local network. Mm -hmm. At least he's confident, too. And he was thinking he might just set up uh, each room separately himself with a Harmony remote, either Echo or Google Home devices in each room. So basically, on the concept level, what are our thoughts on having all the gear in one place and controlling everything with a single professionally installed system versus having gear in each room with a Harmony remote and an Amazon or Google voice control that he would set up himself. Well, okay. In general. Okay. Systems that are that are of the type that your installer is willing to set up uh, are for people who want the setup but do not have the ability or the desire to do anything themselves. That's right. At all. And there is nothing wrong with being one of those not people. Not at all. There's no right or wrong answer here to that. And it can be it can be great. You oh know, my those god! Systems it, can be we're, wonderful. We're talking about, you know, if you if you spend the money, th- the most amazing theater experience you've ever mm-hmm. had. Like you walk in and it senses you walking in. And it starts dimming lights or turning lights up or whatever. You sit down in the seat. And the lights go down and the screen opens and everything's powered up and it's all. I mean, it can be amazing. Yes, but it's gonna cost a lot of money. And if you want to make any changes to it, you usually have to get your installer to do it again because they don't usually want the user, the homeowner, 
touching any part of that system, which is another reason why they prefer to have all of the gear in one place rather than going from room to room and having separate setups that then all have to somehow be controlled centrally as well. Uh, Not that that can't be done, you know, on the concept level, if you're just like, I like to have an AV receiver and my sources in the room with my display, as opposed to having, you know, five AV receivers all in a rack downstairs. I like to have an AV receiver in each room. Well, an installer can totally do that. Right. That, you know, that's, that's not the thing, you know, they would be totally willing to do that. Um, But you would still, if you want to make a change, if you want to replace that AV receiver, you probably wouldn't be able to do that yourself. You'd probably have to call the installer to come back and do that because they need to reprogram the whole system to now use that new AV receiver. That's right. That's right. So, like I said, there's nothing wrong with being one of these people. You know, I've been in houses like this and, you know, the systems, you know, are usually, you know, very well executed if installed under the direction of people who don't know what the heck they're doing. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's, it, you know, it, like the, the customer's always right. So the customer says, I don't want to sure. see any speakers. And I also want this entire wall to be a... Uh, a window and this other wall to have a huge uh, fish tank in it. Yeah, yeah. Like, yep. okay, well, it looks like we're not having side surrounds. Yeah, <laughs> you know? or everything's in the ceiling, or everything's in the ceiling, Which or whatever. Very and, you know, and so you're not this guy right. or this person. You tap or not this person. You are somebody who is, first of all, willing to sit through two hours of this podcast. Mm-hmm. So kudos to you, dude. But on top of that, you're also an IT guy, so you're not afraid of running wires yeah. or you and know, you're not afraid of technology of in general and using apps and stuff right yeah yeah so uh you know i you know i would say what's important to you yeah. and if what's important to you is that you know everything be professionally installed and everything to look really nice but you want to you know you want all the electronics to be you know in one place or maybe in multiple places around the house that's what you have to tell these guys you just have to say you know, I, I, I'm going to buy all the speakers or, you know, I'll mm-hmm, buy the speakers mm-hmm. through you, install them, run all the wires to here, label everything, and I'll buy my own, the rest of the gear, and place it in there myself. You know, it can all come out to a closet that's near the home theater, and then that's where it is. And then, oh, yes, I want some speakers run in each, in, in yeah. these four rooms, and I want the wires to be routed to this panel. Yeah, because right there, there can in be the a room. sort of halfway solution where the yeah. installer is still involved, but it's not quite the, they did everything. So, I mean, there are people who want the magical experience of I just walk in, I don't know how any of this works. Here's the number I call if I want to change something or if something stops right. working, but I have no clue how any of this is happening. And but then there are the people. Ins- who are like, I yeah. want my hands, I want my fingers in every part of this, right. and that's the polar opposite end. But there is an in-between. Right? Yeah, so, I mean, you could go from, all the way from cut holes in my ceiling and my right. walls at these pl- points, you know, run, you know, have speaker wire draped out of them and, and over in this other spot, and I got it. Yeah. And then there's the, you know, the, what I was talking about was kind of an in-between, whereas, you know, install all the speakers, make everything look perfect, but here's where you route the wires to, mm-hmm. and I will install the control devices and the you know the switches and everything else. But I know he did want to ask uh, on that notion of, so like, let's say you're going to have enough rooms that you're going to have five AV receivers. Um, do we prefer the idea of all five of those AV receivers are in a rack somewhere, or do we prefer there's an AV receiver in each room? What do we think is better? Better? I don't think it matters yeah. one way or the other. You know, do you like to be able they're... to see the front panel or not? That's kind of what it comes down to, right? If they're all in a rack somewhere, you, you can't see the front panel. That I mean, that's about it. But the info button on your whatever it is will tell you what is on your front panel. Yeah, as long usually. as it's set up to show it on screen, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's it, to me, I don't think there, it, it's six of one, half dozen of another. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter you know where the stuff literally resides it's more important you know uh that you have access to it and you're comfortable with where it is now the little wrinkle to that is like let's say he decides i'm going to have them all in a rack together but he is going to take care of how everything is controlled he's not going to have control for installed because he wants manual control he wants to be able to change things himself that is a more complicated thing to make right. sure that uh, you're getting your control system, like if he's using harmonies or something, it can be done, but 
if it's all in one central location, now you have to go, okay, I have a harmony in my hand. I have the hub basically in the room with me because that's only a radio frequency connection between the hub and the remote in your hand. And right. then I have to run the extender from the room all the way down to the rack. And I have to make sure that it's precision IR control because I don't want to just blast out IR to everything in the rack, right? I want to make right. sure that each device is controlled individually. Whereas the control four system, that's all going to be done by the installer. And they're probably going to use nothing but, you know, RS-232 control or something like that. So, I, I'll be honest with you. I mean, there is something to be said for, especially if you have a very, very complex system like this. Yes. That he, we're talking about that control for the uh, oh, yeah. Crestron stuff. I mean, it is... Well, the big thing there is with those systems, you can pick up any controller anywhere in the house and control any device anywhere in the house. Yeah. And it's all one interface... And if you got wife and kids who are not as tech savvy as you are, it always looks the same. Everything is controllable, no matter which remote. If they take a remote to another room, it still controls everything in the whole house. To get a harmony system that you control yourself to work like that is it's nigh impossible, right? But if you're like, I have this remote, it stays in this room, it controls what's in this room and some other things that are on my network... That right. can be done. If you want it to control every light in your house from Harmony, you can do that because all of those are on your network. Right. But it'll probably only control the electronics that are in that one room. Now, that's no problem. If the remote always stays in the room and it only ever controls that room, probably not an issue. Well, we've had this problem before where somebody's had multiple dead-end receivers uh -huh. and they have trying to control them all individually. Yep. And we're like, well, you can basically use an IR emitter yeah the little precision right, emitter that just goes directly emitter. over and only controls that one device yep you can do it that way but it's you know any invariably you're going to end up at some point with something turning on that's not supposed to be at on. at which point switching. the argument for having everything in separate rooms starts to come into play that starts to make more sense than having it all centrally located where some of that ir might start might start yeah. getting into other things also in the control four system you get status right you can see if a light is on or off you can see if a av receiver right. is on or off a tv is on or off whereas with harmony it's like you don't get that state it's not two-way right. communication you don't get that status and that, report and things can get out of synchronization the problem that you're going to run into is you're, there's not going to be an in between if you want that control four or that Crestron mm. stuff. There's not going to be, they're not going to say, okay, you install all your own gear and then I'll come program. No, yeah. Or, well, I mean, That's, they will, but it'll cost you more than if they did it. Yeah. It's, it's sort of like, you know, it's $300 for me to fix your car. It's $500 if you try to fix it first and I have to. That's right. <laughs> I, have to, I have to, you know, it get that It costs more if you, out. the homeowner, <laughs> tries to help. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you can talk to the AV installer about this, but ask yourself some really important questions about what is, what, you know, what do you really need? Um. You know, do you really need five AV receivers in this house? I mean, maybe you do. Maybe yeah. you're going to have five separate systems, but, you know, can you do that same, whatever you're thinking about doing with a, with a distribution amp and... You know, like the the mono price we were talking about. Or like one thing I really like is like, like the music cast system, which is right. fantastic. Like what I love about music cast more than any other of, of the wireless whole house audio systems is that when you're using it on an AV receiver, the AV receiver doesn't have to change anything. It doesn't have to switch to stereo. It can keep mm -hmm. playing surround. It can keep playing Atmos. And you can play that very same audio out of another zone without the AV receiver having to do anything. I don't know why no other wireless whole house audio system could do that. But right now, only MusicCast does it, which is a great feature as far as I'm concerned. But that means you're using the MusicCast app. If you want everything from one universal interface... Control 4 can do that for you without it being music cast. And now everything is one interface. You're never switching apps. Right. Right. So it, it basically comes down to that. Uh, to me, it mostly comes down to, do I want one consistent uniform interface in every room of this house? And I control everything in this house from any room, no matter which controller I pick up. If you want that, then it's worth having the professional do it for you. That's my opinion. Boshko, 
Boschka was taken to putting movies on his computer, making sure to retain the Atmos or DTS-X audio and using his computer for playback. He knows his AV receiver can accept Atmos and DTS-X, so how does he get the immersive audio formats from his computer to his AV receiver? Up till now, he's just been using the audio outputs built into his motherboard, but those can't pass Atmos or DTS-X. So does he need a new sound card for his computer? What do we recommend? Making sure they retain the Atmos or DTS audio and use playback. <laughs> uh, you need HDMI. That's what you need. You know, yeah, I was gonna say. Yeah. And it, it, for a while there, there was just like the one board, right? The one video board that would actually output Atmos. Oh gosh, I mean that must be going way back to when HDMI 1.4 was new. Yeah, so <laughs> it's uh, not the case anymore. Yeah, um, but you should be able to get all this stuff out over HDMI because yes. there's nothing magical about it. Yep. No, I mean it needs to be HDMI 1.4. But that's going back a ways. So unless your computer yeah. is real old, um, yeah. So yeah, what you need is HDMI. You don't need a sound card. Uh, if if there's anything you're going to be adding, it's going to be a video card, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, well, that's yeah. what I was talking about. There was a video card that went. On, it was the only one that was doing. What was it? Was it? Was it? It was a H, HDR. It was probably 4K and HDR. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah, that must be what I'm thinking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mean, here's the thing, though. He's talking about. His computer is his playback device. Yeah. He's backing up movies. They've got yeah. Atmos and DTS-X. I don't yeah. know if that includes 4K and HDR discs or if it's just Blu-rays, 1080p Blu-rays, because some of those do have Atmos or DTS-X. Right. right. If it is 4K and HDR, I'm thinking since your computer is already your source device, you probably want to be able to like watch Netflix in 4K and HDR through your computer. You probably want to be able to watch YouTube in 4K and HDR through your computer. And if you want to do those things, um, you need to be a little bit uh, aware, like in particular in the case of Netflix, uh, it'll only work with the Windows 10 uh, full creators update after that. Um <laughs> And it has to be through the Edge browser or through their own Netflix app, right? To get 4K HDR through them, and you have to have just the worst. You have to have a compatible <laughs> HDMI output for those things. Ed, Edge is fantastic for getting you all the ads. Right. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for all these sponsored links. So you, you have to, I have to scroll you have past. to have the the right HDMI output, which you can add with a NVIDIA GeForce 10 or 20 series video card. That's what I was talking about. That was the. Yeah. The card and it doesn't have to be up. high up. It can be the 1050, which is very affordable, right? It's it's not great for gaming, but if all you need is this, then that can do it. So there is that to be aware of. If it's truly 1080p Blu-rays uh, with Abos and DTSX, you just you just need an HDMI 1.4 output, which your motherboard probably already has, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe he's got one of those motherboards that only has DVI output or something. It's an old right, computer, right, right. Uh, and he's just been using his sound card. No, what you need is a video card in that case, and you might as well go ahead and get like a GeForce 1050 because it's cheap mm -hmm. and it'll do all the things. We can do one or two more. One or two David. more, at least, yes. Well, at least. Hopefully three or four. <laughs> That'd be nice. Uh, unless this unless this is a real short answer here. This, I think this so. It's an update. Good. Most of the text is update. First an update, David says. A while back when David was preparing to install his theater, we said to go ahead and run speaker wire for any and all speaker positions they might ever want to use, and even even if he isn't going to use them right away. He took that a step further and installed six RBH in ceiling Atmos speakers, even though his Denon X4300H can only use four of them at the moment. He installed them where top fronts, top middles, and top rears would go, and and we said he we'd be interested in hearing his opinions about which combinations sound best to him. At the moment, he's running 5.2.4. The wires and even the speakers are present to allow for a 9.2.6 setup. But he's held off on getting any external amps yet for the same reason as Tom has described a couple times. All he can really make use of right now is an additional two channels. But if he's getting two channels, why not use them to power his fronts? If he's going to power his fronts with an external amp, maybe get something a bit nicer. And if his front left and right get an external amp, with about this center and then a five channel is only a few hundred dollars more than this three channel and pretty soon he's over a thousand dollars when he started off at a hundred uh-huh uh-huh yeah went down that rabbit we hole climbed you. myself back up and back out and, and got the hundred dollar amp, amp. <laughs> <laughs> and powered your top middles with them but regardless, right now, no surround back speakers. So it was a traditional 5.2, and then he started listening to top middles. And since you can't configure the X4300H to run top fronts and top middles together, he called his top front speakers front heights. Mm -hmm. 
He watched some movies that he didn't think were all that great, but he loved Atmos and felt it made a worthwhile difference. Then he disconnected his top middle speakers and connected his top rears instead while relabeling the top fronts as top fronts. His experience was that things sounded more enveloping this way, and he wanted to mention that Netflix... Netflix's The Haunting of Hill House is a standout in terms of its Atmos effects. He really felt like he was in that house. Nathan also mentioned that to me, and I, that's my next I thing I so want to watch it. I haven't got to it yet either, so that's great. That's yeah. great news, because we've got Atmos yeah. set up, so let's, let's hear some good Atmos. Oh, that means I have to upgrade my Netflix, though. Dang it. Uh, so he has settled on top fronts and top rears, but he liked the way certain effects sounded when he was using top middles. So once an affordable processor receiver is available that can use six overhead speakers, he's looking forward to it, which means no regrets about having installed the extra in-ceiling speakers. Okay, good. That was Those fun. things exist, but they're not really what I would call affordable yet. $4,000 is kind of the minimum. So uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, coming along. So he wants to buy his forever front speakers. Now, his plan was to audition two pairs at a time, keep keep the champ, return or sell the losing pair, and that way he'd eventually end up with something he really enjoyed for many, many years to come. He envisioned it being a long but enjoyable process, and candidates on his current shortlist include a Cath R series, Focal Aria, and Electra, a Sincera RBH signature reference, Ravel Performa, and Legacy Audio Studio HD. Those are He's all very for, nice speakers, so, yeah. yep. He, yep. He's looking for front uh, bookshelf fronts, and around $2,000 a pair is sort of a max price is considering. The recall is that the same RBH wholesaler who sold him his in-ceiling speakers is willing to sell him the RBH signature reference speakers for under $1,000 a pair, which is more than 50% off. He was always going to buy those speakers and audition them at some point. But he wants to know from us, should he still go through the competition or would ignorance be bliss? <laughs> Just buy them and forget everything else. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't. I know. I can't. I can't. I can't. As good as, I, I mean, want to. If I want to, like, I can't. The opposite is okay. if someone said, these are the speakers I bought. I love them. What do you think? And we'd be like, yeah, they're fantastic speakers. Yes. You got great speakers. So I would still say that, but but you have the chance to audition. Ah, <laughs> uh, this is tough. This is tough. I mean, like you, I'm struck because there's a part of me that wants to say, you could totally get those speakers, never listen to anything else, and we are guaranteeing you, you got some great speakers there. But... Our hearts. Our hearts. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> wow. I know, right? Uh, you hear this how much we're struggling? Would... I'm sure this is exactly what he... Uh, like, we are He's probably... probably sitting there thinking the exact same thing we're thinking. We are uh, probably making the exact like... same sounds he is making. Yep. I don't... I mean... Okay, so let's do this. Let's say he brings in the rbhs and he brings in one other pair of speakers right right what in just because we'll know that if he likes rbhs over those speakers he's gonna like rbh almost guaranteed sure. over all the other ones okay which are the ones mm. i'm leaning towards the sierra sierras yeah I mean, I, I, I go there, too. I don't want to sound all biased about it, but I mean... Kef also interests me because yeah. they're a, such a different design. They're a very different design. I mean, the Electras with that beryllium tweeter, that's... that's We're really not narrowing this down very much. Dude, so far, uh, we basically <laughs> mentioned three of the five <laughs> other options here. <laughs> what if he got... <clears throat> what, what if he got... He, he gets these RBHs, signature reference. Yeah. yeah. He gets the Sierra 2s. Okay. And he gets the Focal Electra. What, what if he got three? You thought that the Sierra 2s and the Focal sounded similar, though. Well, not like super similar. I mean, like, like of, See, I think he of should go relatively Kef, equal quality. Kef Ascend and RBH. Kef Ascend RBH? I can dig that. I can dig that. I can get behind that. Okay. There we go. We've, par we've pared it down to three. And now yeah, all three of those, and then if you like the RBH, don't you're done. Yeah, yeah, you're done. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can dig that. Yep, I can get okay. behind that. There you go. All right. We feel, I I feel eighty like percent good about. I, I that. feel like I didn't help at all. I felt like that we was helped. a terrible suggestion. We totally shortened his list. He had a oh short my god! List if somebody offered me those 50, those things on fifty percent off, I would just I would have I would have already already in the mail. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> like we, like Rob said, if you said I got I was going to audition all these speakers, but somebody offered me the RBHs for fifty percent off, and I jumped on them, did I make the wrong choice? We'd be like, nope. Exactly. Great. Yeah, that is that is absolutely true. If that were the way it had been phrased, yeah. yeah. Uh, Greg and Justin. Yeah, I guess very similar. Greg up. Greg upgraded from a JVC RS46 projector to a JVC X590. He cycled through all of the available preset picture modes and tried the various gamma settings, but nothing seems to look right. He primarily uses his Apple 4, uh, TV 4K as a source, and it doesn't seem to matter what material the f is 4K HDR or 1080p SDR. It doesn't seem to matter whether the material is either one of those. He can he can get it so uh, so bright so that bright images look good, but then dark images are way too dark. Or he can get the dark images looking okay, but then the bright images are washed out. There are a multitude of sliders to adjust, but shouldn't at least one mode be relatively close out of the box? What are the settings? What should he be setting these things at? Yeah, yeah, it's a little uh, it's a little bit tricky. Um, so. I'm going to point you to, so Projector Reviews, who does excellent projector reviews, and that's all they do. Uh, they reviewed the RS440, which is the exact same thing as the X590, why JVC has to have a pro model and a consumer model that are identical but have different numbers. I don't know, but it's the RS440 in the pro uh, series, and they put their picture settings in there. Okay. And then Sound and Vision, they didn't put the settings for their... Uh, whether I don't remember if it was the X590 or the RS440 that they reviewed. They did review it, but they didn't put the settings, but they did put their settings for the similar but more expensive X790. Okay. So they have the settings for that one over at Sound of Vision. And you will notice some similarities. Both yeah. of them recommend turning off the auto iris. That's almost always the case, though, isn't it? Well, no, not on, like on the Epson projectors. You absolutely want the auto iris mm. on there. On the Sony projectors, you want the auto iris. But on the JVCs, they're like, yeah, they kind of put the auto iris in there because people are like, how come you don't have an auto iris? And they're like, because we don't need it because our panels have extra high contrast natively. But people are like, yeah, I still want an auto iris. They're like, okay, here's a broken one. So <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. So turn off the auto iris because this whole thing of it looks good when it's bright, but it's way too dark when it's dark. It's like, that's the auto iris closing mm. down. Um, that, that could definitely help it all on its own. However, both of them did mention They've got this weird kind of gamma setting thing in the JVCs where you've got these various gamma modes and for the most part, that's fine. In HDR, you choose the HDR picture mode and the ST2084 gamma because that's exactly what it should be. Uh, and in standard dynamic range, you basically choose the normal gamma. You go to like user one or user two and just leave the gamma alone because it's already fine. But they give you three little sliders below the gamma control. Uh, one says dark, one says bright, and one says picture tone. And they're like, yeah, that picture tone needs to be turned up. Uh, the thing looks too dim. Okay. And so if you look through the settings that they've given both at projector reviews and at sound and vision, you'll notice they're, they're not identical, but they were different units. They're very, very similar. Uh, so I will have the links for those at avrant.com, or you can just Google projector reviews, RS440 review. Go through the settings there, and that should help you out. But mostly, I think, turning off the audio iris is the problem. All right. Uh, along the same lines, Justin upgraded from a JVC RS2 to a JVC RS500. He's yeah. been super disappointed by how dim it looks when it plays any HDR content on his 110-inch silver ticket screen. SDR looks great, uh, but it seems as though with the HDR, it's trying to save a bunch of headroom for the tiny bright highlights resulting in everything looking way too dark. He's got OPPO 203. Should he just try to retain uh, the wide color while forgetting about the HDR mode? And on a side note, he took our advice and just bought a 30-foot extension cable for his headphones, and it works great. All right. Well, great. Okay. <laughs> uh, is this the auto iris again? It sounds like the auto iris again. Well, no, because that one doesn't have one. They oh, added it go. the following year. Uh, so yeah, it's not the auto on this. This one, this was the first batch of projectors that JVC made, the RS500, was the first batch that was compatible with HDR at all, but they didn't do it right. Uh. So JVC themselves released some settings that are like, they look wacky because that means like moving the sliders way up, which mm. you're not used to doing, but they have their own. I remember this. Yeah. I remember this. Yeah. 
they have their own settings for HDR and wide color that you do need to implement because uh, it, it ba basically HDR just wasn't done right on the RS 500. Uh, it was it was early, early on. It was the very first HDR projector they ever made. And uh, yeah, it wasn't right. You need settings. And they wrote them down. Again, we'll have the link at avrant.com or you can just search JVC HDR settings and it'll come up on Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. That's really? Good. No, no, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, oh, it's no, two hours, Rob. Two hours, Rob. We have like right. 10 people left. It's okay. <sighs> I, I, I'm going to sleep easy knowing that we have lots of questions for next week. Yeah. Nick we'll B. We'll get through them. Don't worry. Uh, was that Nick B? Was it B? Yeah. We had a, we had a Nick. Nick. We had a Nick A, and now Nick B. Nick B, you are on the list. Uh, Joel N, who got to be on Twitter. Kevin C. Brian F. Steve. Carl R. Michael R. And that's what's on the list. I did get some other emails that came in on Monday. That's okay. It. All right. We want to thank our listeners for the week. Uh, Robert and Nathan for going to www.abrant.com and uh, buying us a cup of coffee from PayPal. Mm -hmm. And our 82 patrons over at patreon.com, including Brian and Steve. Yeah. Robert and Nathan, thanks very much for those PayPal donations. Thanks so much to our 82 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast. Brian and Steve, thank you for being two of them. We also want to thank uh, Nathan for taking me out for a drink the other day and Brian for uh, talking us up to Chief. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Nathan, thanks for uh, for visiting with Tom there. That's nice. Uh, Brian, thanks for talking us up to Chief. Uh, Jay, when you, when you get here, welcome. Your listener of the week. Yeah, I was going to say, it's going to take him a while. Yeah. All right. If you want your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. Ask by emailing us at question at abrant.com. We will get to you. We answer all questions. Yep. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.